Is this thing on? Are you ready, Matt? You're listening to Box Office Binges with Matt Diaz and Ernesto Santos. Good evening, folks. We have a wonderful evening's entertainment lined up for you. We know each other. He's a friend from work. Box Office Binges. Matthew, I think we are really excited for this week's episode. I mean, I think this may be one of our most highly anticipated shows of the year. For for many for many reasons. Uh, yes, so to speak, I would just say, uh, you know, in, in the spirit of the movie we're reviewing this week, let's fucking go. Let's wow. let's do this. Let's get this started right on Front Street. Yes, right indeed. That. Yes, right off the bat. Uh, we are reviewing uh, probably one of the most anticipated movies of the summer, Deadpool and Wolverine. And we have Nick DiLorenzo back onto the show. Hello, how are you? Thank you for coming on uh, amidst your very busy schedule that you we were talking about right before the show. So it's very appreciated every time you come on and just talk with us. Oh, well, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be back for, I think, the third time, right? This is. Or fourth? This is. Third, third or fourth? This I is think this is the... F- is it the third? Third, no. probably. I think no, there, wait. It's no, definitely, had... it's not lower than three, and I can't imagine it being more than four, so it's probably one of those two. <laughs> I want to say, I want to say it's four, because you were oh. on for something at the beginning, right. I don't remember what it was, and then That's we right. had you on for Glass Onion, and then we had you on for uh, uh, Indiana Jones, which is the last time, which was a year ago, which is crazy that it's been a year since that movie, um, and, and I also remember you saying that, hey, we want to bring you back on again what movie you think you would want to come back for and you were said the new dead the new deadpool movie and we honored that and we were not gonna stray away from uh from that so we i've i've said it from day one you're the most consistent podcast um of all time (laughs) you 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 say something you commit to it and then you follow through it's the podcast with the most follow through absolutely Mm. yeah consistency is the key to any it's really the key to any kind of success um but the first time we had you on was trial of the chicago seven. Oh, that's yes. right wow yeah, yeah, yeah okay uh that that's right i knew it was something else so this is so welcome number four fourth time on the show oh wow well, i can't believe i went three to four in five seconds that's pretty like, great like S- <laughs> like sml you when your next time on will give you a jacket oh yeah, oh, yeah. what's the box <laughs> you'll be part of the five timers <laughs> club <laughs> Yeah, maybe you guys give like a hat or a scarf or something. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're gonna have to come up. We have to come up with something. Or your own cause... popcorn bucket. That would be. Ooh, fun. that's yeah. not a bad idea. idea. Yeah, we're I like that. that one. Yeah, we're definitely gonna see that one. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, so the movie in question is gonna be Dev Home Wolverine, uh, starring Ryan Reynolds, Hugh Jackman, Emma Corrin, uh, Matthew McFadden, and a shit ton of cameos that we're definitely gonna be diving into. Uh, written and directed by Sean Levy. Uh, who did uh, Free Guy, The Atom Project, The Night in the Museum Trilogy, Real Steel, Date Night, Cheap Brother Dozen, The Pink Panther, Big Fat Liar, and multiple episodes of Stranger Things. So he is no stranger to the uh, the plethora of movies, specifically comedies that he's directed over the years. Um, also written by Ryan Reynolds, who was credited as a writer, as well as a writer in Deadpool 2. Um, Rit Rice and right. Paul Wernick, right? Yeah. Um, and Paul Wernick, who were responsible for Deadpool 1 and 2 and Zombieland 1 and 2, as well as Zeb Wells, who wrote episodes for She-Hulk and Robot Chicken. So a lot of people involved in the writing process of this movie. Um, but I believe Ryan Reynolds, Rat Reese, and Paul Wernick were involved with all three Deadpool movies. So they kept that consistently throughout this trilogy that we have uh, before us. But before we dive into the movie, and also... We have a lot to discuss over at Comic-Con. We want to bring it back over to you, Nick. It's been a year since we've had you on to the show. How have you been? And primarily more specifically, because Ernesto and I are huge into uh, the Oscars, and we know you had a part in that, and we are so jealous for it. <laughs> yeah, very, you were there. <laughs> yes. yeah, small part. But yeah, I so I... I got the chance to work on the second Oscars uh, for, for at least me. So that was super fun. Um, that was great. Um, yeah, that was just a really cool experience. I think it's like, I don't uh, like, I have such vivid memories of watching the Oscars. I feel like specifically in college too, 
you know, and, and uh, I think I never thought I would be in that room. And granted, I wasn't really in the room. I'm kind of like off, off you know, like I'm in the room, but I'm with the other people that aren't wanting to be, you know, <laughs> not shown, you know, uh, but I, uh, yeah, it was, it was very neat, very surreal. Um, it is very cool to kind of be in the same room of all these people as you see them, like, like you go to use the bathroom and you're like, oh my gosh, there's that person that made my entire childhood just waiting for the <laughs> urinal with me. Um, Isn't that crazy? <laughs> and uh, it is, it is, is really bizarre. It's also funny that the Oscars takes place in like the same complex that like a Dave and Buster's uh, like Victoria's Secret is, you know, like it's just a bizarre <laughs> we, in a sunglass hut, which I think is maybe the, the, uh, what a, what a great representation of Hollywood as a whole. Um, and, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it was it was very neat, very cool experience. Um, it is such an interesting production given the fact that it's truly live. Like working on like a late night show that's like live to tape is like kind of you know you have like a couple hour window between taping and then air, but then to have a broadcast that is truly airing live is I think uh, just adds that much more energy and excitement I think in the room, and that was really fun to be a part of. Um, and I thought this year's Oscars, I mean, I'm biased, but I think it, they went really smoothly. And I was really proud to be a part of the, play a small role, you know, in, in a team that really made it happen. And I think delivered a, a, a great broadcast. So that was really fun. It was neat. I agree. I mean, uh, compared to previous years this year when Kimmel hosted, I think it was probably one of their more successful years. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I thought it was hilarious that, you know, we, we hadn't spoken like in a few months or so, but you took the time to send me a video that you had, maybe you were like a cutaway shot and you were just kind of in the room. And it was that <laughs> Sunday morning special, that CBS Sunday morning <laughs> special. And it, they were, they were interviewing Kimmel and, and part of the team of what it takes to, you know, host the Oscars and what goes into all of that. And you were just in the room and it was a cutaway moment. And they, and you were looking so astute. You're like, yes, 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 this is important. We're going to, we're going to be talking about a few things. Um, but I just, I was like, for me, it's like, wait, I know that guy. He, I know him. And he's on CBS Sunday morning, and it's fantastic. So it, it's always cool to see uh, our friends succeed like that. And uh, I, I know I'm just geeking out. I think it's great what you're doing over there at Kimmel. And, well, it's very uh, kind of you. I also send that to you because you're like, um, there are very few people who who actually appreciate it and make me feel good about it. I think sometimes <laughs> I'll obviously like you know my family is very supportive of everything, but there are very few people who are like, I, I to me I, I'm just so excited. I'm like, oh, I know that. Matt and Ernesto will find this exciting, who also appreciate this kind of stuff, you know? So yeah. I always appreciate the in, you you indulging that and, <laughs> and watching the videos I said of, of myself, yeah. Well, I mean, it's I mean it's so great just to see, like, where we came from school. We were talking before mm -hmm. the show, like, you know, I told Matt, you were my favorite anchor. Like, I had to deal <laughs> with him in order to get to you. Um, no, but honestly, all serious, you were a pleasure to work with, and so I could totally see why you're succeeding, like, You've always been somebody who gave 110 percent, and like I just I love seeing you win. Like you seeing you win just fills me with joy. So it's yeah. oh, that's so it's sad. just it's it's so it's so great to see you doing well. And I can't wait to in years to come when we force you to come back on the show to hear <laughs> more where you are further in your success and how uh, we can exploit that. <laughs> <laughs> Look, there's you, you, well, first of all, thank you. That's very nice of you to say. And and likewise, you guys are on. Was it two thirty? Nine. We, we, we're on two twenty-seven. Two twenty-seven. Oh, we're getting okay. there. <laughs> Almost there. Um, well, first of all, I mean, hats off to that run. That's pretty incredible on its own. But you know, it took me everything. If I wasn't so um, paranoid about being uh, an upright, um, law-abiding citizen, I wanted to wear a wire so bad at the Oscars and just have you guys live stream it. <laughs> hey, just have an exclusive live feed of behind the scenes <laughs> so there's always next time <laughs> and and now to our correspondent <laughs> yeah, exactly. just, yeah just live from inside the tuxedo of a very sweaty nervous writer's assistant <laughs> you know what and it would have been fantastic it yeah, would have been glorious been I'll um, give you a little, a little pen. To put on I'm your sorry I'm not cooler, and I'm sorry I'm such a rule follower. That's really to the detriment <laughs> of, of all my friends' podcasts. No, look, look, you're still young. Eventually, we'll get there, and we're going to be still doing this podcast. And by before episode 500, we're going we're gonna to get that exclusive. I just have <laughs> okay. a good feeling about it. Yeah, exactly. 
but just very recently, um, we had a chance to catch up. I visited LA. I visited you. You were very gracious and allowed me uh, to uh, spend the weekend with you. I chilled in your apartment. You have a very comfy couch. Um, and uh, we we also had a time to experience something because I reached out to you. I was like, hey, I'm coming to LA to specifically see John Williams perform at the Hollywood Bowl. Would you like to join me? And you're like, absolutely. And so we did that. And, uh, and, and it was an interesting experience, to say the least. Uh, first things first, we came there to experience John Williams conduct some of his own work and kind of praise movies in general of like of his own work. And we wanted to see and hear a lot of the scores that he's produced. Uh, and unfortunately, about a month before the show started, we found out that he was not going to be there. Uh, he, he came with and he said it was it was an illness. And he said he's going to recover, which I was like, OK, that's like a, like a month long uh, away. But thank you for letting me know that. And uh, and instead, David Newman, who he was co uh, conducting, David Newman was going to conduct the first part. John Newman was going to come out and do the second part. David Newman decided to do the both parts. And and we all had a good time uh, listening to John Williams. And I just thought, like, as movie lovers, it would be really cool just to briefly talk about that experience, uh, because not every day you get to see. Uh, a movie composer that you've listened to for years and have produced these massive scores uh, from massive franchises and then actually hear that music live from the person who wrote it is a cool experience. Unfortunately, we didn't really get that because John William wasn't there, but we also got a different experience. So I'll have Nick start that experience uh, and then I'll interject. I will that. briefly start it, but I really want you <laughs> to talk the most about it because I, I, I love fun. So I think from the email, I think it was maybe the the inciting incident of uh, yes. a little industry lingo uh, <laughs> of I think maybe when our denial started um, started. I, yeah. I think that also the big lesson I think learned just really read the 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 email, <laughs> read the details, yes. read the read, right when it says event info, just read it. It doesn't and not just not just skim it, but truly read it and then kind of think about how it could be interpreted from any sort of corporate angle that might be trying to loosely <laughs> convey something um, <laughs> and be technically true um, and and don't ever, um, I think, run with your assumptions, I think is really the long lesson. Um, yeah, I, I think that overall, now that we've had a, a, a month <laughs> a, a month removed, basically, yeah. um, I think it was an enjoyable night. I think it was it was fun. It was a neat experience. I think I'm also... It's a, I think it's a little easier for me because I also have to acknowledge um, that I didn't fly here to, you know, <laughs> so being a local, I'm like, I got to go into this beautiful venue, hear some beautiful music by an orchestra of people playing instruments I couldn't even fathom to learn. And uh, it was great. However, um, that aside, uh, definitely not at all what I was expecting. And yeah. um <clears throat> I think <laughs> I felt I felt gross. I, I was like grossed out with myself for how much I had totally created what I now realize must have been this fake event in my head <laughs> yes. that I thought was going to be the case. And I don't think we're like completely in the wrong for getting there, but I do also yeah. acknowledge that it is on us that we yes. weren't. Yeah, if that makes sense. I don't know, Matt. You take you you're yeah. You explain it. You, okay. You, you yeah. Your experience because you're the one that traveled and had more of the planes, trains, and automobiles type deal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, aside from the plane, yeah, I did take a plane, a uh, Uber, as a bus. Um, yeah. I thank you, Ernesto, for going to that. First, I 100% agree with you. We were at a beautiful venue. This was the first time I was at the Hollywood Bowl. And if you're watching us on uh, YouTube or on Spotify, uh, spot or on Spotify, uh, this view of the Hollywood Bowl is amazing. You can see the mountains. I believe you can see the Hollywood. You can see the Hollywood sign from there. You can't straight through. You can't see it in the photos as well but it's blurry but if you look it's like framed oh, yes, perfectly right. by those two mountains that are yes it's, that. that's right um and so it's just a great venue open air that the hollywood bowl and um i was like really getting swept away by it. you you wouldn't even tell there's a massive highway right behind us or next to us um it, the mountains really just close everything in and you're i was ready for a night to be absorbed with the music and so uh when we hear John Williams, Ernesto, before I even get into this, when you hear that you're, it's like a night of the movies, or what's it called? The uh, Maestro what? of the movies, I think. Maestro of the movies, like with 
with John Williams. Anyway, you, you know what you know what, you know what I'm talking about. What do you think this night was going to be? Just based off what, just like what the poster says or what we kind of talked about before. Okay, so you're gonna you have your orchestra on the on the stage, and there's I see the screen. So I'm assuming they conduct they're they're conducting movie music, and then the screen is gonna show like maybe clips that coincide with what they're playing. Sure. Uh, but what music are you expecting to hear? Oh, I don't know. Like, don't put me on the spot. Like, no, 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 not not specific songs. Just like what what score would John, you expect? John Williams score, like, you know, his yes. music, the exactly. music that he's conducted, the things that he's most famous for. Absolutely, I'm glad you said that um, <laughs> because uh, that's not what we got. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so David Newman comes out and he's giving us a sweeping like this is Hollywood, right? We got a lot of famous scores interjected into this medley and it was it was great. It was great. And then he comes out and says, hello, welcome. Thank you for coming out. John Williams is sad he can't be here, but I've been off, you know, given the chance to kind of conduct the whole thing. And it's going to be fantastic. Um, and then he says that we're going to be playing songs and movie scores that inspired John Williams. I was like, oh, okay, cool. We're getting a story. We're going along this line here. Um, and then eventually we're hearing more scores and it's like, and then we heard the score from the Pink Panther, which is another composer that John found influence in. So I was like, okay, so now we're hearing specific scores there. And then he's, then, then John, David Newman goes, all right, to end the first half, um, we're going to be playing um, a score that John really loves. Uh, one of, one of his favorites uh, from the adventures of Tintin. That he composed from director John uh, from director Steven Spielberg in that movie. I was like, okay, cool, interesting pull, Tintin. All right, not not what I was expecting from the John Williams uh, piece. So then, about halfway through, we're halfway through. We've heard one John Williams song, and we're like, okay, maybe maybe the first half is like first half is going to be like what inspired John, and then the second half is going to be like all of it, and then so much so that as soon as they come back from the from from break, they play. Uh, John Williams Superman theme and it's great it's fantastic then it goes into like all right now here's here's a couple of uh, scores that J maybe you didn't know that John did um, and they played like the uh, a news theme that he did uh, I believe it's for NBC News I'm not I'm not entirely sure that's what I want to um, hear <laughs> yeah uh, they also uh, played the Olympic score that he did well so this this part was pretty cool I thought, I thought it like, was pretty cool they did like NFL Monday night or Sunday night or something. Sunday night football like yeah. da, 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 da. and so like okay okay this is cool and we and there was something else that I believe that I don't remember what it was oh the Olympics that's right it was the Olympics it was the 1984 Olympics it was the NBC News score and then it was the Sunday night football theme and I was like okay cool and then and then he goes and now um, we're gonna go down uh, the 19 something classic Laura and I was like what what <laughs> what's that <laughs> what which, what are you talking about where's the scores man <laughs> <laughs> where is Indiana Jones? <laughs> yeah, where, where is all this? And then literally after he played like a, two songs from Laura, he's like, and um, I guess we're going to play some Star Wars and wrap it up. And I was like, uh, what? And so he plays his Star Wars, right? And it's great. Everyone has their lightsabers out and they're just going at it. And they're selling lightsabers outside the venue too. Hmm. And uh, gonna Nick, are you going to say I, something? I, I, I would almost, but this could be me projecting. But it almost felt like he was playing it with a little bit of resentment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there, there was a tinge of, I know what you stupid nerds want. Here you go. Oh, God. <laughs> and it was, there was a little, and I'm, I'm, compl I'm sure that is not the case at all. But it was, it maybe it was just the emotions that maybe the, that uh, Matt and I were feeling in the moment. But it felt yeah. like he said, um, fine, I'll do this barely, but only because you're making me. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wonder if contractually, like certain songs, like his most iconic ones, have to be performed by him, like in this situation. I think, like, I think he's got enough pull where I think it's really whatever he wants. Yeah, no, I agree because we went, we looked at previous ones because he does this on a yearly basis. Uh, this was actually the first year that he did not perform like live there, and so he's played other themes throughout the concert like it's a different experience every time you go to oh, okay. but to but, but I, I i but ernesto to your point i'm sure there's somebody being like john baby we're selling lightsabers out front if you don't play star wars <laughs> at least once we're screwed <laughs> give them that give me one you don't have yeah. Indy or star wars Pick yeah <laughs> so so they play three suites from star wars i believe the main theme the luke and leia theme and another one that i don't remember um and then he leaves 
And I was like, no way. That's it? We're done. And then he comes back out. And I was like, okay, all right. So then he plays Marion's theme from Indiana Jones. Not the main theme from Indiana Jones, not the Raiders March, Marion's theme, which is fine. I was like, okay. And then he went off and played E.T. So, which was really cool, especially it's like it was at that point, it was nighttime. It was really cool to hear that that sweeping music play. And then he plays. Uh, like dun da da dun da 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 da, and then then from there, so he played, he closed it off with Star Wars, and then he said good night, everybody, and that was it. And I was like, wow, that is a lot we left on the cutting room floor. We got no Harry Potter, we got no main theme to Indiana Jones, we uh didn't even get Jurassic Park um in there. Like he is known for so many iconic themes that they decide not to play. And so much so that at one point in the the show, David Newman even recognized that he is known for the iconic films uh, in the last 50 years um, and his music and decided not to play it. And also, I know that we weren't in the wrong, Nick, because as we were leaving, there was his dad telling his little girl dressed in full Harry Potter <laughs> robes. And he told her, sorry, sweetie, maybe next year. That little girl just wanted to hear Harry Potter, and we did not get it. You know what? On the other side of that dad, in his other hand, was his son dressed head to toe in Tintin, and that kid was ecstatic. <laughs> He's like, I can't believe they did Tintin! <laughs> um, My I, life is complete! <laughs> I, I'll say, I think that it's kind of funny, because looking back, it's like, one, this is just so, it's so funny that it's just, uh, it's we're just two, two, two nerds just really bashing the Hollywood Bulls. <laughs> <laughs> prestigious, prestigious How dare prestigious. they? <laughs> um, I, 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 I let, let that irony not be lost. But I do think that um, I think it's funny as the night went on and you look around and you're like, oh, this is definitely more of a like museum, like over 50 crowd where they're just here to hear kind of like whatever from the world of like cinema. Yeah. And then it's an assembly. Like if, if you if you went in, this is why I think it's ultimately was on us. But at the same time, not really, because if you read it, because like on the website, it said like from I, uh, I have it, it right here. Oh, yeah. I read, read it. Yeah, I, read it yeah. I read it. I saved it for this. Because it's funny knowing exactly what happened. <laughs> yeah. And so that's what that's what it feels like when Nick is saying it might be on us. Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, but we went in thinking this was going to be much more of like a celebration of strictly john williams's contribution to movies yes and it would be his famous score so like if you are a fan of his movies and um you would then hear like I, at least the majority i think i think i think correct me if i'm wrong but i, I would imagine like there's part of my part of me that was like okay there's no way they're gonna get through all of it right. but you're going to hit 90 percent of it you're like you might yes. walk away thinking like oh they didn't do schindler's list but or or catch me if you can. But yeah. um, there's the going to be like, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, but the second they hit Tintin, I'm like, oh, they're doing all of it. <laughs> yeah, or deep cuts. Oh, we're, deep go, cuts. we're going deep, John Williams. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but here, I, here's what the description yeah, was. Yeah, it yeah. says legendary uh, composer John William Curates. It was composes, but now since he wasn't going to be there, they changed it to Curates. Right. Um, so j legendary composer John William Curates three magical nights of movie music with the Los Angeles Philharmonic. A maestro David Newman leads the L.A. Philharmonic in a memorable program that includes Williams' iconic scores from Star Wars to Superman, as well as music from Hollywood's Golden Age, featuring selection of film clips. Mm. We got that. Well, and when they meant from Star Wars to Superman, I think they, they meant, meant to Superman say Star Wars, Star Wars <laughs> and Superman. <laughs> uh, no, and what's funny is that when you read that, and this is my fault for not really reading this ahead of time, I read the event, and I think maybe the shortened summary were... Sure whatever um when you do when you read it like that you're like oh now having seen it that's exact it is if you need to go into that event with zero expectations and, and and if you and i would imagine i think matt you said this when we were there that this probably became like a tradition you saw multiple people coming in with like old t-shirts from different years of mm -hmm. the same show with the bowl and i think this is probably a really neat annual activity for people where you go and use a different playlist every time which i think is probably 
a really fun and enjoyable thing. And some years I'm sure you get something that you didn't get before and it, you know, it's special in that way. But I think, um, it's just the way we went into it was definitely not the way that, um, you should be primed to, to go into it. Yeah. And I also feel like that, you know, me being the first time here and I think me traveling contributed to this and something that I kind of built in my head because I knew about this for years, but the timing wasn't right until now. Um, and so and even looking at that poster that Ernesto put back up there, this poster was on for sale. I actually spent like over a hundred dollars just to have a blanket of this. Cause I thought this image was so cool. And I didn't oh, think cool. that, yeah, I didn't think cool. that, I, yeah, I didn't think I was going to hang a poster and I don't think I was going to wear a t-shirt, but that blanket just looked like, yeah, I'm, I, I can, I can sleep in this. Well, that's um, a couch blanket. It's exactly, it's actually, that's exactly where it is right now. It's on the couch. <laughs> um, and I just, I thought it just looked so cool. Um, and it's just kind of like these little nuggets of all the film, that he, all the film movies, all, all the movies that he's been involved with, with his music and, and like in, and like in this treasure chest, like I just, I really like the design of it. Um, and, but yeah, I, I think it's, I think what also we talked about this in the ride home and literally it was like, a, like the entire conversation so much so that uh, Nick put on a John Williams plays because I felt like we got shorted um, <laughs> on there. So I just, I just couldn't see Matt cry anymore. I was just trying to. <laughs> it's like, dude, it's OK. <laughs> Calm down. Um, but I, I think I think it would have softened the blow a little bit if John Williams was actually there because like, yes. OK, at least I got to see a maestro a master of his craft and actually see him conduct music. The fact that he wasn't there and now it turned like, well, I, at least we'll get to hear his music live. And then that also didn't happen. That was just like a, Hmm. Okay. Unfortunately, none of that happened. And it was so funny because when we were literally driving back to, uh, to your apartment, I asked you the question like, well, since John Williams wasn't there and this happens again next year and we knew for a fact that he will be there and he might be playing different scores, would you do it again? And I think the answer is yes, because I still never saw him live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the conclusion we came to, I think, was it was like this perfect storm is too dramatic, but like it was this perfect combination of you traveling a long way the person you expected to see wasn't there. And then it wasn't exactly what you were expecting. And I think if any of those things are kind of removed from the situation, I think it really lessens the thing. Cause overall, I think we both agreed still a good night, still enjoyable, yeah. still fun. But I feel uh, like, yeah, if he had been up there, I think we would have been walking away. And I think we had even mentioned this on the walk to the car. Um, I'm like, I don't even think we'd be having the conversation we were having because we would just say like, I think I, at one point we just turned to each other and be like, huh, I, I thought I would have thought that he, he would have played more of, yeah more of his stuff um specifically but hey that was great that we got to see this you know living legend you know do his thing yeah. my hold on so my question so when you read that out you said that it was three nights so i wonder if the other two nights you could have got a mix of something else or do you think all three nights was the i think all three show? i think all three are the same right For yeah i'm year? pretty sure i i think i remember looking into it because we went on the second night so the first night uh i, I think I remember reading that it was pretty much it was pretty much the same. They only change it every year. I think is the same show when they curate it for that year. For the so follow up question: With the money you spent, do you feel like you were gypped, or do you feel like you got some semblance of your money's worth, considering that he wasn't there and he was supposed to be there? I, I do feel like that, and 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 a part of me, yes, I do feel like I was gypped uh, because mm -hmm. it wasn't what I was expecting. But we talked about a lot of, on, this, on this podcast about expectations. Um, but I think when we were talking to when I was talking with Nick, uh, literally r shortly after, and I think he made a really good point that kind of put me at ease. And this was toward the end of our conversation about the John Williams experience, uh, was that if it was a normal night and you got everything, what you wanted out of it, we would not be having this conversation right now. And I think it makes it even more memorable that it didn't go the way that we wanted, because now we have this shared experience that we would probably years later, look back on and say, do you remember when we tried to see John Williams and then it didn't, and then they didn't play the music and then, then all that stuff, as opposed to, oh, remember that nice night we had and we heard John Williams music? That was cool. So I think the story that came out of it is going to be much more memorable than the experience that I was expecting to have. So it's also, it's also so funny that like our, our terrible night was that the orchestra still showed up and played. It wasn't like we got rained out. It wasn't yeah. like, you know what I mean? It's so funny that like, all, like, all things said and done, they were they still showed up. We still heard live music, you know. Um, 
yeah, and he's he's absolutely right. And so you kind of just have to take it for what it is at that moment and just kind of laugh about it. And um, the fact that I was able to see it with Nick, a friend I haven't seen in years, it just puts the you know the the cherry on top of the cake, mm. um, or the icing on top of the cake, whatever, whatever you put on top. I, of the cake. I, yeah. I know what you meant. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, <laughs> whatever you put on cakes, candles, flames, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, uh, but yeah. So anyway, that was our experience over listening to John Williams. I, I think I still recommend it. Uh, it was still a fun night uh, that we had, and you got to see it at a really cool venue at the Hollywood Bowl. So definitely a lot of cool things to come out of that for sure. Um, but anyway, as we move on from uh, our experience, Matt, with... to, are you still boycotting all of his movies? Though is that still happening? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's gonna be hard to like I, I I'm, a, I'm a huge nerd. I cannot watch his movies. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, going from there, we're going to be talking about um, some of the news that came out of uh, San Diego Comic-Con 2024, Marvel being a big part of that. Um, and so first thing we're going to talk about is Marvel Studios return uh, returns to Hall H uh, with some pretty, pretty big announcements that I'm sure we're going to be diving into. Uh, the biggest being that the Russo brothers are returning to the MCU to direct the next two Avengers movies that will officially be titled Avengers Doomsday in theaters made 2026 and Avengers Secret Wars in theaters May 2027. We knew about Secret Wars and then we also knew that Avengers the Kang Dynasty was in turmoil with everything that's been going on uh, with Jonathan Majors and we knew that eventually it was just called Avengers 5 and then we found out that it was called Avengers Doomsday. So before I get into the Doomsday conversation, does that feel like that's its own right? Let's quickly just talk about how the Russo brothers are coming back to direct two more Avengers movies. Do you think that was the right call? Nick, I'll start with you. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm definitely not in it. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm excited. I'm, I'm interested to see what happens. I thought they did a great job with all the Marvel movies they've done before. And I didn't expect this to happen. I feel like I'm so naive when I, then you see all those like press interviews where they ask them like, are you ever coming back? You know, and they're like, I don't know, we've had our time. I'm like, they're probably never coming back. And I just <laughs> never account for, um, I guess, time and maybe ultimately money. But um, I do think that they have a great track record. I'm super excited to see what they do. And, and um, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like this could be really interesting. And, and they've really proven themselves specifically with maybe two of the most densely packed character superhero movies of all time. Mm-hmm. Potentially, yeah. you know, and within the Avengers franchise itself. So um, I don't know. I feel like who else could have that kind of track record, you know? So I feel like that's. I, don't, I think it looks good. I'm excited. Ernesto. I think the word I, I'm going to use is unexpected because they've obviously proven themselves with, I mean, Endgame being one of the most successful movies in any movie franchise ever made. Um They've shown that they can handle, like, core characters on a grand scale. So we, we have hope that these this is going to be, this is obviously going to be successful. I, I mean, I think it's going to be fine. I think that they're going to do a fine job. At least now Marvel has a direction of where we're going. And it's, it's, a, it's the safe option. You know, mm-hmm. So that's really the best way to look at it. it they know they, they're, they're placing a bet on something that's a sure thing when... When they've been through such a whirlwind of uncertainty like that, you know, and as is even discussed in when we talk about Deadpool and Wolverine, they even make a nod to about MCU being at a low point right now. And so this is just this is just part of the Bob Iger course correction that we're on now. But, so, I'm, I mean, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that it's going to do well. But I think the, the more interesting thing is the RDJ coming back as Doomsday. Yeah, yeah, as... Following that announcement, it was revealed that Robert Downey Jr. will also return to the MCU, but this time to star as Doctor Doom, presumably yeah, in Doctor Doom. Yeah, sorry. yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Doomsday is the movie. Yes, um, as Doctor Doom um, in, uh, presumably starting in Avengers Doomsday. We don't know for sure if he's actually going to be starting in the Fantastic Four. I guess we'll find out come next year. Uh, but yeah, as, as at least before we get into that, just specifically talking about the Russo brothers, um, there were rumors prior that Sean Levy was being approached to direct the next Avengers movie, and that obviously, you know, he he said he was going, he said that you know he turned it down originally and said that he's you know he's uh, focusing on event uh, Stranger Things five, and so, uh, but then there were some rumors that the release schedule was going to be pushed back, and so for Avengers, and then 
uh, maybe he was able to squeeze in and direct it, which I think even coming out of watching Deadpool and Wolverine, I think that would have been an interesting move, just given, you know, the high box office success that the movie has been, as well as getting all these characters together. But to your point, Ernesto, the Russo brothers, not really surprised that they are coming back. Uh, Variety came out with an article saying that they were paid $80 million uh, to direct these two movies. It's so, good reason to come back. Yeah, I would say so. So they basically got uh, 20, uh, 40 each uh, and basically, you know, going down math, uh, 20 million to direct each movie per person. Um, so interesting move that obviously they spent a lot of money to secure them. And also an interesting move for the Russo brothers to want to come back. They have their own production company. Uh, but really, since Avengers Endgame, they came out with um, the Cherry, which was on Apple TV Plus and uh, the Gray Man, which was on Netflix both of which were not highly received and both streaming movies. So we don't really have a box office number to reflect that. So giving off of that, and they also have a show on Amazon prime called the Citadel, which they were producing and maybe directed an episode or two um, that also wasn't highly received with that as well. So it's interesting to see that here are the three projects that they worked on in the meantime. And now, you know, maybe they give a lot of money. Uh, we're going to be coming back and directing the next two Avengers movie, which I do agree with you. Ernesto does seem like a safe bet. Uh, but with that, now we're talking about Robert Downey Jr. coming back as Doctor Doom. That is probably the biggest news that's been sweeping at Comic-Con this past week. And I will have to say uh, I'm a little bit 50-50 on, the, on this news uh, because there are other great actors that could have donned the mask and be Doctor Doom, one of which the first person that comes to mind is Cillian Murphy, or Killian Murphy, that would have been a fantastic Doctor Doom. And and it's interesting that this seems like a safe bet for Marvel to bring back Doctor Doom. We're also leaning into the multiverse of it all. So what does that have to play into it? Um, there, I'm not not saying that I'm not excited about Robert Downey Jr. returning, uh, but it's just it, it was a lot all at once. And it, in a, in, a, in a way, I've been seeing uh, people online call that Marvel is desperate of bringing back the Russo brothers, bringing back RDJ, and it seems like all in a safe move. And I more or less disagree with that. I don't want to really call it desperate. I just wanted more of like, it's a risky move because both the Russo brothers and Robert Downey Jr. came off of a high of Endgame. Mm -hmm. And for my opinion, you are now tarnishing that by coming back. So if you don't come back and it is not as good as the other Avengers movies, then I feel like that unfortunately lessens the impact when you decide to leave leaving Endgame. Um, and some could say the same thing with Hugh Jackman coming back as Wolverine, which we'll get into in our Deadpool and Wolverine uh, conversation. But um, Nick or Ernesto, what do you think about Robert Downey Jr. coming back as Doctor Doom? Nick, we'll start oh, with ahead, you. Nick. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, uh, yeah, I think kind of similar to that. So the, I guess the one, I guess to your guys' point, like with with the RDJ and 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 the Russo brothers, I think the the I I saw those kind of concerns as well um, of like sustainability and like well clearly they're good at what they do but like does does this mean that they have like a lack of faith of other people being able to take this and then evolve and grow and do more mm -hmm. you know having to like come back to um and is this kind of like the short term but I I feel like. I just I think because he's obviously such a great actor and he's done such a great job in this in this genre and, and um, universe um, specifically that I, I'm 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 kind of just excited and open minded. I know so little about you know, we all we all know so little about what this project actually is and and True. what it will be that I'm I'm going in pretty open minded and just kind of excited. These are both talented. Um, or, or, or all the people involved are talented and have clearly proven their their worth in these hyper specific uh, movies. And yeah, I, I have no, I don't know. I, I feel like I haven't been given like I, I understand the the maybe concerns that certain people are voicing, but personally, I don't know. I, I feel like there hasn't been a reason to to doubt that this could not you know just be great. Hmm. Ernesto. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat. I was. It was a little weird at first, like, oh, okay, that. It definitely fine. didn't see it coming. Yeah, I, I did like not see it coming at first all. First time I had to like triple check what account it was posted on. Yeah. To see if it was verified. Yeah. But what I could, what I do say, because I've seen, I haven't read. It's you know, they Brian Michael Bendis, who's a comic book writer. He posted this image, which is what 
what assumingly his character is going to be based off of it's invincible iron man where i believe iron man basically becomes dr doom um so it could be sourced from that there's also um another a theory floating around online that um this is going to be an iron man from another universe and that he's an anchor being since rob rdj was could have been the anchor being for 616 you know, they try to bring him back, but he's really doomed, and that's what starts his takeover. And then we learn about anchor beings during Deadpool Wolverine and Deadpool Wolverine, you know, and then now they make this reveal. So could mean nothing, could be the plot of the movie. Who knows? But it's 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 something that makes me go, okay, well, there's at least – there's a few couple of places they could source material from. And um, if you've never read Brian Michael Bendis' work, he's a fantastic comic book writer. So I'm – I'm hopeful that this could be well, and just as you said, I mean, RDJ, he's he's fantastic. He can ad- he can adapt and mold to any role. I mean, look what he did for Oppenheimer for Levi Strauss. I mean, look what he did for Iron Man. Look what he created as as for the MCU. Like it starts with him. I could see. I mean, think about you know a Doctor Doom that looks like Iron Man, and Spider Man has to go up against his his this evil men this evil man who is who looks like his mentor, like the reason why mm-hmm. he is Spider Man. So there's some interesting dynamics there story wise that could be explored. I'm I'm here for it, but that's the whole part. That's the whole beauty of multiverse storytelling, where it's it's another it's another plot device that we can use that's weaved into how we tell stories and different kinds of stories that we get to tell now because of this tool we have of the multiverse and parallel timelines and other worlds yeah i um i was having i was texting uh chris nielsen in front of the show um as literally as soon as this news came out he texted me and we were going back and forth on a few things and uh, i want to credit him for get, for kind of bringing on this analysis that he called um meta knowledge um, and I might even bring that up again when we talk about Deadpool and Wolverine, but I thought he made a really good point by saying that, like, the only reason why we're having this visceral reaction about RDJ as Doctor Doom is because of this meta knowledge of what we have on his performances with the MCU, with everything that's going on, and I feel like it's less about, can Robert Downey Jr. play Doctor Doom? Absolutely. There's no doubt in my mind that he can handle the weight and give us a very interesting villain out of Doctor mm-hmm. Doom. But because we have all this information about Robert Downey Jr. and his history with the MCU is what is driving this conversation right now. Um, and so it's just interesting to kind of think of it that way. And uh, I uh, to to your, both of your points, I'm going in there. I'm going to be open minded about it. And I hope that, you know, we are eating, uh, you know, eating our words of any doubt that we had that this could work, um, because I feel like that once if it hits, it's going to hit hard, uh, like. Either way, it's once it comes out, if it's if it's going to be a success, I think it's going to, you know, be an overly fantastic, like what a bold move. And it worked out fantastic. Uh, Mm -hmm. But if it didn't work out, then it would just be more of a like a harder blow, um, I think. So I think it's like high risk, high reward on on Marvel's front to what they're doing moving forward for the next couple of years. Um, So, yeah, so. Huge news, Robert Downey Jr. is now playing Doctor Doom in this multiverse story that we don't really know what's going to be happening, but a lot to come out of it. Other other things to come out of the Marvel panel is the Fantastic Four officially being titled uh, The Fantastic Four First Steps, with the film taking place in the 1960s retro future, and it's going to hit theaters July uh, 25th, 2025. So we just got a new title for the movie and a very brief description about it. Um, and then as well as Marvel also revealed that Juan Carlo Esposito will be will star as sign Sidewinder, the king of the Serpent Society in Captain America Brave New World. I know nothing about this character, and I feel Neither like I was I feel like a lot of people were a little bit disappointed that it wasn't a bigger character. I think people were expecting that, <laughs> given that Juan Carlo Esposito is such a prolific actor when it comes to his villainous roles. Yeah, I mean he could have easily been uh, per, they, a lot of people wanted him for Professor X. Yeah. And it's funny when I met when I met him at Comic Con, we asked him. I'm um, excuse me. Yeah, uh, at MegaCon, uh, we asked him about that about yeah. him wanting to be, and he just he was very adamant. But he goes, Yeah, it's a great role. It works for me, but um, I just don't want to be stuck in a chair all day. <laughs> so, but to me, this makes sense. This, this, yeah. I'm sure that if I had to guess, it's some kind of smart ass villain. Which is, hello, he's uh, Breaking Bad. Like he's yeah. Gus Fring, he's Gus Fring. So, <laughs> why yeah, not? I, I'm here for it. 
I hope that something bigger comes out of this um, because I would I I don't want him to be like a secondary person into this big movie. Like I don't want to see him like sidelined One as he's villain. playing. Yeah, another villain into like the cog of whatever this movie is going to be, which we got a trailer for a couple weeks ago, and it looks interesting. It looks like the espionage feeling that I got from Winter Soldier. So, um, so hopefully he doesn't get shortchanged in this movie. Um, and then uh, Marvel Studios president Kevin Foggy says uh, that the cast of Captain America: Brave New World, the Fantastic Four: First Steps, and the Thunderbolts uh, will appear in the upcoming Avengers movies. I feel like that's a no-brainer, but I guess he just said it to confirm it that. All of these characters are coming together and, you know, whatever the Avengers doomsday slash secret wars is culminating to, uh, we're going to get something out of it. And what's crazy is that, like, this movie's in two years, like the Avengers doomsday is in two years from now, less than. And I feel like we're now hearing about it. And I feel like they have a lot of work to do uh, between now and then. And uh, the fact that they haven't even started filming the Fantastic Four yet. And that movie comes out next year. They just I was like. Filming. It just started filming, uh, so I was like, "Okay, wow." Um, but yeah, before we move on, any any other comments, Nick, about the wrapping up the, about the Marvel? Uh, I'd panel? say, I think I don't, I don't know what it is um, specifically, but I just I'm really loving the look of the Fantastic Four movie. Mm. Mm. I'm excited about it. I think it's different, and I feel because it's the same director as um, most of WandaVision, right? Or yes, all of yeah, WandaVision? all of WandaVision. Yeah. Matthew Shaman. Um, Matt and Shaman. I think he did such a cool mix of genres within that uh, miniseries mm-hmm. that I feel like, or show, however they refer to it as, but um, I feel like having that um, retro future look, I think fits perfectly with, I think some of the best moments of, of WandaVision. And I think that all of the little stills and artwork and everything that I've seen so far, I just, I'm really excited about it. I really think that that's a really fun way to handle those heroes specifically and i feel like not that they haven't worked when they've been adapted into like the modern setting or whatever but i just think this is like a fun direction i don't i'm i'm on board with it i like what i see so far um i um what was i gonna say to the oh i'm curious how much they're going to because you had mentioned that the the projects that they were talking about primarily um how, how all those characters are coming together in these new Avengers movies. And I wonder, because they had been outputting a lot of new characters post-Endgame. Like, you have mm-hmm. your Moon Knight, She-Hulk, like, you know, um, all, all the all the movies that came out post that, mm-hmm. and really, Mrs. Marvel. And, um, like, I, I'm assuming most will carry over, but I know there are some less popular ones that I wonder if, like, yeah. I, I wonder how much is being, like, I, I wonder if they're using, if in the long run, the shift away from the Kang dynasty storyline. I wonder if that actually will help them sort of retcon a lot more or just sort of say like, you know what, we're just going to cut our losses and, and keep what worked and then move forward. So I'm Mm -hmm. interested to see how many people carry over to this next Avengers movie, because I have a hard time believing that she is going to pop up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <I agree>. Uh, <laughs> that is very yeah i mean that's a good point to see like what works and like obviously like will the events of loki season two how that ended uh will that play effect into these avengers movies primarily yes it has a big effect in the multiverse but also at the end of that they kind of just put a button on the whole kang story um and right. they basically said that they're not a threat at the moment which could have easily just been a tease that eventually they would be. But now at this time from all the shows and movies we come out, is like Kang is no longer a threat. I was like, right. oh, well, okay. All right. If you said <laughs> that's it, then that's what it kind of came down to. Um, so I, I do agree with you. I'm kind of also curious of like what storylines that you were going to put into Kang dynasty is now moving over into doomsday um, and how that has changed, even how you approach the fantastic four or how you're approaching secret wars. Um, like how much of Kang was he involved and how much story you have to now change that we would never know about um, going into these future movies. So, yeah, definitely some interesting stuff here. We and the the fact that, you know, Marvel has been on a slope lately. Uh, we're seeing we're seeing what they're doing. We're seeing the uh, we're we're rebuilding. We're seeing what those plans are. And so now we have to wait a couple more years to see that come to flourishing. But we're seeing the restructure. Uh, play out in, in you know real time here. So it's quite interesting, especially when we get into our Deadpool and Wolverine conversation. Uh, but before um, we 
before we dive into that conversation, I want to briefly wrap up our Comic-Con uh, discussion. Here were two other news that came out. Uh, the Boys is getting a prequel series called Vault Rising in the 1950s, set in the 1950s in New York, about a humble beginnings of a Monsters Corporation Vought. Announced during San Diego Comic-Con 2024 panel, Vault Rising will see Jason Eccles and uh, Aya Cash reprise their roles as Soldier Boy and Stormfront from Prime Videos. The Boys, executive producer Paul Grenlin, uh, Grenlong, uh, the producer behind the boys season three and four scorpion and revolution uh will serve as a showrunner for the series it was also announced that soldier boy will be a season regular uh in the boys fifth and final season vat rising joins other spin-off shows in development including gen v season two which is coming in 2025 and the boys mexico uh which is coming soon as well so i know nick you have not been uh you have not been watching the boys, but Ernesto, another spinoff in the works following these characters kind of quickly, like, yay, nay. Are you happy with the spinoffs? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think Gen V proved that the boys can survive outside of the main show. Mm-hmm. And they even, I haven't seen the, um, the little animated shorts that they have. Oh, um, diabolical. Diabolical. I haven't seen it, but I've heard good things. It's very reminiscent to, um, uh, Star Wars Visions, where it's yeah. like little short animated, and each episode is like different animation styles. Um, so I'm actually curious to watch that. But I mean, Gen V is fantastic, and it works as such a great complement. It's like you, they they need each other to survive, but it's amazing how they survive on their own, but yet at the same time complement each other. Because in this last season of The Boys, you see small crossovers from Gen V, where they they appear, but they're not necessarily crucial. To the storyline where you need all this exposition you can you get a glimpse of them and if you're interested they go oh well you can these whole characters have their own own show that's separate from the boys you, you get what i mean like yeah yeah they work they work well to complement each other as a franchise as opposed to being like oh well if you don't watch the boys then you're not necessarily going to understand this if that that makes sense but i yeah. i'm excited because they they seem to do world building pretty well yeah, and I, do, and I do agree with you with that. And I feel like in some ways it's like, okay, are we getting to like the Walking Dead territory where we have the main story of the Walking Dead and then it's Fear the Walking Dead, the Walking <laughs> Dead Beyond, the Daryl Dixon story, the Meryl, the the uh, the Rick Grimes and Michonne story, the Negan and Maggie story. Uh, like, I feel like we can be leaning in toward that, that, that kind of realm. Uh, of course. But, but so far with their spinoffs and the main storyline, which they've already confirmed it's ending with season five, uh, most likely coming in 2026, I think they said. Um, so, like, so far they have not proved us wrong that these shows are just, like, cash grabs. Like, we have have got some really cool stories and, like you said, world building within it. So I'm excited and also like these two characters. So see, like, the, the, this version of them kind of come back in, like, in the 1950s settings sounds pretty cool. Um, and then lastly, uh, to round out the Comic-Con news, uh, DC Studios, which didn't have a large presence at this year's Comic-Con, but uh, it was revealed, it, it, DC Studios revealed its new logo, um, and it pays an homage to Milton Glacier's uh, DC Comics logo that ran from 1976 to 2005. The logo is referred to as the DC Bullet. Uh, in a video message that played during the panel, James Gunn joked about the decision to resurrect the old logo, and he said, I can pretend we worked long and hard on what the what it was. But the truth is that we knew the logo to be we knew what the logo wanted to be. Sorry. The truth is we knew what we wanted the logo to be when we were put in charge of DC Studios. So it's kind of cool that they're paying homage uh, to the classic DC's DC logo, as well as we see that with some of the the shots, like some of the uh, um, some of the uh, the stills that we've seen on set from Superman we can see that they're honoring a lot of the classic look of Superman. So I think this logo just imbues that as well. So um, it's, it's simplistic. It's great. I think it, I think it works well. I mean, it it makes me feel like I can design logos. (laughs) (laughs) It's so simple. It's like, man, I could do that. That's easy. (laughs) Yeah, it looks great. But I'm like, all right, I guess that's like, I feel like if I spent 10 minutes, I could figure out what font that was. (laughs) (laughs) Um, um, I think it's fine for now. Maybe you yeah. know it's going to evolve. We've seen the Marvel one evolve over the mm-hmm. over its many many years. Um, also, so, is it just weird? Does it look similar to Donkey Kong? <laughs> <laughs> it just DK. replaced it with the star. <laughs> or DK, yeah. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I don't mind that it's simple. I really don't know much about this DC logo, but um, yeah. I, I do like the main thing I took away from this was like we are continuing to pay homage to some of the classic uh, history, rich history that DC has. And that's so, like a good homage. I'm exactly. Yeah. Um, it, it just shows that maybe he, ha- you know, he has, you know, it's a deep, maybe it's a deep cut for like hardcore DC fans. Like, oh, he's bringing back this classic logo. You know, <laughs> I mean, he's so, he's so he's always shows such fascination and love for comic books in general. So yeah, let's see what the movie looks like following the logo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have high hopes. So I, I do have high hopes for James Gunn. I mean, he's gave a, he's gave us some of the, he's given us some of the best comic book movies out there. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, we have to wait another year to see Superman. What comes out July of 2025. Uh, we did also get a trailer for creature commandos, which is technically the first project to come out of DC studios, the animated series um, that is going to be releasing on max on in December. So that's coming later this year. So that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, anyway, that's all the comic con news, all the big ones that kind of came out of comic con this year. Uh, so now, we're getting into it, the meat and potatoes of it all. Let's dive into our spoiler review of Deadpool and Wolverine. This is going to be a great conversation. A lot of nerd talk. Buckle up. Let's fucking go. Uh, Nick, we'll start with you. Your thoughts on Deadpool and Wolverine. So I think overall, uh, super fun, obviously. Great. I would, I'll would, i say maybe best opening I can think of off the top of my mm. head for a Marvel movie in a very long time. I think like the it probably wasn't 10 minutes, but I, like my instinct is to say like the first 10 minutes, but that whole opening credit sequence, like a me- oh, wait, and we're, we're, we can go into the spoilers and stuff. Oh right? yeah. Yeah. Spoilers, okay, yeah. Okay. I think knowing that you are opening up a movie where people maybe more, um, more often than other movies are going in concerned about how you're going to handle the legacy of another movie, which is kind of a rare <laughs> like um situation i think to be put in as somebody making a, a new movie yeah um and then to address that immediately with i think maybe the funniest possible solution where you then take the skeleton of the person that they're all worried that you're not going to honor well enough and then have an <laughs> opening fight sequence with his bones and then <laughs> like using him like a puppet i I, one, I, I thought it looked beautiful, like the this, this snowy forest, and I thought the visuals looked great. I think some of the better CGI in yep. m- more in the more recent Marvel projects, and I, I really, I thought the whole tone and feeling right off the bat was, like, I, I was already excited, and from that moment on, I was like, I am buckled in. This is great. I, I was so excited for the rest of the movie. I think the opening was... Uh, far and away, the, probably the best opening of a Marvel movie I can I can think of. I'm sure I'm gonna re- maybe regret saying that. There's exceptions, but um, I, I was that good. I just I thought it was really great. Um, I think overall, I thought the visuals were pretty good. It, it was nice to feel like for something that literally takes place in different dimensions, it felt um, more grounded. It felt like they were at least in semi locations that mm-hmm. felt tangible and more mm-hmm. practical. I think in, in, in moments that that was like I think refreshing. Um, I think uh, the final post credit scene, maybe my favorite post credit scene <laughs> in recent memory as well. Um, I think overall, so I saw this twice now, nice. um, and I think it's definitely more moment driven than maybe overall story and plot driven. Mm-hmm. Like for me, at least, I there was a certain point during the first time watching it, maybe like two thirds of the way through where I remember thinking, wait, what, what are they trying to do again? Like <laughs> what, what, what's exactly there? Like, cause there's so many fun kind of like setups and then payoffs it contained in like these little moments that they do run throughout. There's still, like really great sequences, but it doesn't like, I don't know if it'll hold the same rewatchability. Like, like when you watch infinity war or, and I know it's hard to kind of compare those two. Cause it's like, you know, building up for that for years but like the storyline of those movies where you turn it on and it's building towards this climax that then pays off like all the character work that they've been you know um building upon the whole time it feels like this movie didn't have that same sort of uh journey like story throughout per se even though they they do technically go from point a to point b and you know they each have their arc and their own character goals it didn't feel as 
strong to me in, in, in that area. But I think moment wise, it was a lot of fun to watch. Um, and I think there were a lot of really great um, memorable scenes. I think that that's my main takeaway for the whole thing. Or right, Ernesto. Uh, so initially, like, I thought the opening scene was also, I thought it was great. I mean, he literally takes the bones and makes, gives himself like Deadpool Wolverine cloth. I would love to, I'm, I'm just waiting for that Funko to be created and be marketed to be put out because who doesn't want to see Deadpool with Wolverine cloth on? I mean, that was, that was an awesome moment from, for him. Um, one of my favorite. I'm waiting for it. I'm I'm so waiting. You said that. I was like, I'm going to buy that. I don't know if it, I don't know if it's (laughs) real yet, but I want that. Yeah. Um, I was like, so a couple of things. Like, I love the cameos. I actually really loved all the montage of going through the different Wolverines. And mm-hmm. it's us literally walking through these iconic comic book covers and just having them be recreated with Deadpool and Wolverine or Deadpool reinserting himself into these classic iconic Wolverine scenes. Like, you get the Savage Wolverine. Um, you get the the one where he's on the X and the Red Skulls. He's like, well, I, th- I think we're just going to go in a different direction. You get the <laughs> little... The little small one um i I thought it was fun i i like that the overarching story was very simplistic because it gave us time to really enjoy these moments because i think what Mm -hmm. this movie actually is is like a love letter to 20th century fox and like the movies that got us here like the thing that got us here were those x-men and spider-man movies and then what better and i felt like we just paid an homage to like everything that they've been to and just like the arc of wolverine as a character i I was surprised that we we got a wolverine that had some heart and he had some things i mean there were things that he had to contend with and you know of him losing everybody in in his universe and he kind of shared that with wade and you know they had this 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 thing of um of not feeling like they were enough like and then that's what they were contending with to kind of help them move forward to the next thing and then it's just weaving in through all these comedic setups and punchlines and to me to me it worked i mean it's not connected to the main MCU. it is connected to the mcu but you know they're still kind of own established in their own little universe you know every had this feeling of like you know everybody wants to feel like they matter you know wade trying to get into adventure the avengers and you know like him vanessa wanting to feel like he is something to vanessa um they wanted to redeem themselves they obviously sat you know them sacrificing themselves for what they love and how those people in turn save you i am like granted you know we didn't it wasn't like a you know literally the device was called the macguffin i thought that was hilarious like i literally was like like i died i was like two or three people that chuckled at that and the lady goes why is that funny because <laughs> you don't know what a macguffin is that's why <laughs> um i mean we got wolverine and the cow i mean what better i mean we it, oh it finally God. it finally happened in in full uniform, we got to enjoy it for a second, and then like we get the Deadpool moment. It's like, oh, you got blowjob handles. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the mid credit, the mid, the post credit scene with Chris Evans, hilarious, great callback to the movie. It was nice to not have a, a credit scene that isn't a, that is a setup for whatever's coming next in the MCU. It's just mm-hmm. another funny moment that brings us back in, that brought us back into the movie. But the mid credit one of them showing all the past Fox stuff, that was what really got me. It's like, oh, they, like, it's really, they just love the Fox universe, like, and just really honor what it, where they came from. I mean, this is where Ryan, Ryan Reynolds and, and Hugh Jackman first started out together in, in, on the set of, um, X-Men Origins Wolverine. That's where they first, that's where they first, they, the Deadpool and Wolverine first came together. And this is like a, a full circle moment for them. I mean, it was great. I mean, all the cameos were fantastic. To me, the Gambit one was probably the most hilarious. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, there, there's so much. There's so much to go into this because, like, even again, referencing the like the idea of this meta knowledge. There's so much that we ourselves are bringing into this movie. There's so much outside knowledge that's coming from this movie that that's being poured into it. Like, or Nick, to your point, you said that there's not many movies that we're going to be worried about how they're going to honor the legacy from a previous movie. That should not be your worry when you're going into 
a movie like this. It just sits more or less stand on on its own or going off of like Deadpool one and two and everything like that. But there is just so much history around this. And even Ryan Reynolds himself, like wanted to be involved in the superhero world. You know, he got, you know, he was first in Blade Trinity, which they made a brief callback to when we saw Wesley Snipes return Mm -hmm. as Blade. Um, And like he was involved with that. He saw that in a Deadpool comic that they used him as a reference. Like I forgot uh, what the reference was, but they put his name in a Deadpool comic and he got so uh, enamored by that, that he just wanted to make this happen. And then he was jumping for joy at the opportunity to play Deadpool and X-Men Origins Wolverine, and we know how that turned out. And then he was so dedicated to make this character right that he found the directors of one of the bloodiest movies out there at the time, which was Zombieland, and decided to work with them, write a script, and they they forced... Uh, and they they showed the script and they they leaked the script and everyone was joying about it. That forced Fox more or less to like give them money for a test footage. And then they did the test footage and then that got leaked as well. And that got more excitement. And then we see the first Deadpool movie and like and then we see how that transpired from there. And it's almost like the movie that could like we just see keep growing and growing. It's like the studios never wanted that movie to be not never wanted the movie to be made, but like they you can tell that that's not what the forefront was, but the dedication of Ryan Reynolds got us here. Not only got us to the first Deadpool movie, but it got us to this movie. Yeah. Out, out of like, out of company buyouts and this big, all these other huge factors that comes into play. And then we had Deadpool in the middle of all of it, recognizing everything that goes into it, recognizing the Fox deal, recognizing the characters that came before, not losing that history, the love that they put into it. It's, there's so much going into it, and you can't help but to smile when, you, when that movie starts and you just see Ryan Reynolds digging up the grave of Logan and eventually using his bones of animantium to beat up the TVA soldiers. You, I, I just like literally sat there and it was like, I remember the day when Ryan Reynolds said, we're not touching that. And the first thing he does in the first frame that we see him is literally take the grave and touch it all over. And it is <laughs> hilarious to see that. And like to 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 Nick's point, you just sit there with a smile on your face. You're seeing the opening credits credits. You see him use the claws that he wraps around his hands with the Deadpool and Wolverine logo behind him. And you're just like, I'm just going to go along for the ride because I can't stop smiling right now. Um, And yeah, you don't anticipate to have some of these heartfelt moments that are in here. And uh, and which what's kind of funny that Ryan Reynolds said that he took a lot of inspiration from planes, trains and automobiles to have this buddy cop. Uh, the, the kind of road trip through the multiverse, so to speak. Um, and it's cool because even even Hugh Jackman in there, even Hugh Jackman recognized after he said he was no longer coming back as Wolverine after the huge success and the fitting ending for with Logan, he even knew that the fans would love this, even though they have this friendly feud that's going on and off the camera about Hugh Jackman and Wolverine, like to actually see that come together and have a movie focus on that specifically just makes this all a pure fan service. This movie was pure fan service. Yeah. And I can't help but to like, yeah, there are plot issues. Yes, I don't remember half of what we're doing here. But those moments outweigh the plot. These, The fact that this movie exists and the fact that it's so good and it's so funny and it's being self-aware of where it is right now in the superhero genre it just brings me joy to to be like rewarded as a fan when lately Marvel has not been putting out hits. So that even that even holds holds some weight to it as well. That like the Marvel was not has not been doing so great, and they come out with this one even acknowledging that they haven't been doing so great, and yet we're gonna put Deadpool in the forefront, calling himself Marvel Jesus, the character that should not have been even here in the first place, to then come all the way back around to give us this movie, I, I can't help but to, to just love everything about this. Um, and I kind of want to go by, uh, go by us just a few in scenes. Um, we moving past the opening scene and we're getting a little bit of a flashback. We see John Favreau return as happy as <laughs> Deadpool is literally traveling across timelines. Uh, and they had to make it known that this was the sacred timeline six, one, six, when he's having this conversation and we see happy, and Deadpool having a conversation about joining the Avengers. And I think that's an interesting cameo. Uh, Nick, I'll just briefly just go to you on that. Like, 
having having that interaction start the movie, him going through this timeline and wanting to be an Avenger, it seemed like after the high we got from that opening scene kind of brings it down to that grounded level you were talking about. Yeah, I thought that was fun. I also thought that was smart to... I, because I think that might be one of the scenes that ties it into the MCU the most. Because mm-hmm. I think that's such an MCU character. Like you know, um, I feel like Happy Hogan is somebody that you immediately see and then would connect with, um, with the with the greater MCU. And I think that having that be one of the more fun additions to this third, you know, Deadpool movie, I think that that was smart to have that earlier on. Because really, for the rest of it, it is more of a tribute to the former Fox properties. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that was a fun addition. I thought that was, yeah, I thought that was neat to see. And I think that that was a good, great little, um, a, a great moment to start the movie off with being like, you, you don't know who's going to show up. Yeah. And, and this is, and yes, we know that we now have access to all of Marvel. You know, like, I think that was like a, a, a great way to, kind of set the tone while also obviously you know kicking off the story and you know his motivation for that movie yeah because you also get the moment uh, where happy but like deadpool saying he needs to be an avenger to kind of make vanessa happy when they were going through their problems after he saved her from dying through his time traveling uh but then happy reminding him that avengers do the job because the world needs them to not because you need to be an avenger and i think even that to your point that starts the movie and we see that come back around toward the end of mm-hmm. a full sober moment where he is making a hilarious sacrifice play to save potentially all multiverses, but specifically his own. Um, uh, Ernest, you have any comments on that? I mean, I thought it was great. Why not? I mean, granted it is going to happy Hogan. Who's, you know, he's the liaison for the Avengers, but also yeah. he's the original director of the first Marvel movie. So what, oh, a way a to tie, what a way to tie in the end of Fox to the beginning of Marvel and to kind of bring that full circle as well. And, and just, you know, Iron Man's confidant, you know, his driver, he's like, pull his the car driver. <laughs> That's really he's, good point. Point. That. he's like, his uh, but driver. I thought it was cool. Yeah. I was like, Oh, of course. Like of all the cameos, let's bring John Favreau, the, the freaking godfather of mm-hmm. the MCU to bring in almost it almost feels like that Deadpool and Wolverine is either the start of a new phase or the end of the or this is like the wrap up of the the low end phase. I mean literally Ryan Deadpool says to us, the audience, to about Hugh coming in at such a low point of yeah. the MCU. Like and what a great nod for them to make fun of themselves. And like when I was uh, <laughs> um when I was reading this this interview with uh, that uh, Wendy Jacobson and Kevin Feige did with ComingSoon.net, they were asking him, you know, about that everything's on the table. They, you know, and he's like, nothing feel. Any of you ask Feige like like nothing felt sacred. Everything was on the table, and he's you know they talk about making fun of the MCU and how. The narrative has kind of lost its way since Endgame, and if it made him, if it made him nervous, and he said short answer no because he was adamant about Deadpool being Deadpool, and that if he wasn't, if he had limited them and told them, well, you can't make fun of this, you can't make fun of that, that it really would have limited what the movie could be. They almost like just let Ryan Reynolds just have the keys to the kingdom, just like do what you want. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, he's not wrong because yeah, it would have been. Like if you were trying to safeguard yourself and not make sure that you were, oh, we can't tell certain jokes about our on our own behalf, then that's not Deadpool. And so for for Kevin to kind of acknowledge that and stay true to the character and kind of let them have their way, and also for it to be the first rated R Marvel movie yes. and to be is even as gory. Not really. I, I feel like they were tamed on the on the blood, but they weren't shy from it. So especially in the opening scene, I think more ways than one, that opening scene. And I, I, you said maybe I, I kind of agree with you, uh, Nick, that that could be one of the best opening scenes Marvel has ever done. Yeah, I um, agree. because it does establish so many things for about Marvel at that time. Not only what Deadpool is, not only that they were going to not like not tarnish Logan's reputation, but they were hands on about it. Um, we had this really cool fight scene and there's blood everywhere. And that's all of that we have never seen in a Marvel movie before. Um. And so, yeah, so then we see uh, Deadpool moving on and he's working at a car dealership 
and he said he's retired and he's working with Peter. With Peter has his uh, suit in his locker just in case for Peter emergencies. Poole. <laughs> Peter Pool. Um, then uh, Deadpool was treated to a surprise party. We then learn that him and Vanessa are having some issues and are no longer together. Um, there was a really fun callback where uh, Buck was trying to speak and and Deadpool said no speaking lines for you, which was a callback from the second movie. Uh, Blind Al wants some cocaine, and Deadpool says that Disney said no cocaine allowed. We cannot have cocaine on set, or not on set, but in this movie. And they kept going back and forth between different references uh, of what it is. And, like they know all the terms, they know all the lingo. We can't do it, Blind Al. Blind Al. Um, <laughs> eventually, he gets taken by the uh, TVA, but not before thinking that they were male dancers and they were talking about pegging. And he says <laughs> Disney know nothing about no pegging. Um, but uh, that was a scene from the trailer. And so then he goes in and we meet uh, Matthew McFadden as Mr. Paradox and um, kind of misleading him a little bit on this journey of what Deadpool's purpose is. Because I think he kind of proved that, you know, you're here to save your universe. But realistically, Mr. Paradox just wanted him out of his own universe to help him do his bidding. Is that is that the idea that I was getting at? Did you get that out of it? Well, he's going to he plans to use the Time Ripper to speed up. The, the timeline dime because it's not supposed to happen for a really long time but he wanted to pull him out because uh, why, why did he want it I thought, I thought he thought said he wanted they to... deemed him of a higher importance so they pulled him out of the universe but his is gonna die yeah I thought he, I thought they oh. referred to him as the mercy killer and so they wanted him to like kill other things in the in the different multiverses in the process they wanted to send him to the sacred timeline um where he would play an important role in future events. And that's, you know, we get the, why is Thor crying? Like he's holding him and he's crying. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. And we, which, which we never get an answer to, by the way. We never know why Thor has Deadpool in his arms. And I would like to think that Deadpool, and Ryan Reynolds has come out and said that he knows why. Um, but he, unless he's just lying. Um, but I feel like that would be a potential hilarious callback if they ever choose to go back to that moment. I think that would be great if you don't see it coming. And then like in a, in a future Avengers movie, you just then see that scene starting to be recreated. And yeah. That, and I'm, I think that would be such a great payoff. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and quite honestly, at least for talking about Matthew McFadden as Mr. Paradox, I didn't, I did expect for him to do a little bit more in this movie. I feel like he was just here for plot exposition and, that's about it. I mean, the, obviously the focus was mainly on Deadpool and Wolverine, but I feel like he didn't really do much besides saying that I don't like how the, what did he say? He was, uh, he described what an anchor being was. He described what the time ripper was. Oh, that's right. Mr. Paradox says, uh, we used to just prune these things, simple, elegant, efficient. I'm told the TVA doesn't do that anymore. Well, I do no matter what surprise, what, no matter what my superior says, the multiverse does not need a babysitter. We need a mercy killer. And so he likes the old ways of pruning multiverses, and he doesn't like this new way. I'm assuming following the events of Loki season two. And so now he's taking matters into his own hands and re- recreating the Time Ripper. And um, yeah, and that's pretty much all I got from him. Like, I didn't really get much out of him from there. I don't know if you guys disagree with that or not. I mean, I think he was meant to be like a very one-sided villain like mm-hmm. you know not not much depth just there for as a almost his villain him being a villain was almost a plot device because we spent the more the majority of the time kind of exploring deadpool and wolverine as characters and right. just them they're mainly even even more so wolverine more than anything uh and then it was in that moment where he was basically referred to as like deadpool took the call to action and was like, I am Marvel Jesus now. And mm-hmm. I think one of the funniest lines in the movie was that, one, he said, the power of the Marvel Universe is about to change, which is a such a diss at what Dwayne Johnson said about DC. It's like the hierarchy of the DC Universe is about to change forever. And that was There's just... a couple of those. There was a couple of those like nods uh, to the DC Universe. But then, to me, this is really funny. He says, I'm Marvel Genius uh, Jesus. He headbutts the camera and says, suck it, Fox, I'm going to Disneyland. And, yes. <laughs> and what's even so good about that moment is that right now you can go to Disneyland and meet Deadpool. He is there, folks. 
you can meet him right now. And there is story time with Deadpool and he's interacting with the with the with the guests. And that was such like a third, fourth wall breaking moment, meta moment. And it's just so good. So interesting. I wonder how unhinged they let him be. Like, is it a PG-13 Deadpool? Is it an R-rated Deadpool? I would assume. I mean, you're in the presence of children. And like, how, I wonder how that works. I've, or is it I've closed seen off? I've seen clips that came across my for you page, and I will say it gives you a greater appreciation for the writers of the movie. Really? <laughs> yeah. Are you saying the jokes are falling flat? Yeah, I just think that, I mean, it, also it's Steam. at a theme park where they have to be, you know, way more family friendly or whatever, but it's, it's just not, it's just at a level where you just, it's just not what you would see on the screen. It's just kind of, I, it's I not think what it's, you think it is. What's that? I was like, is it, is it not what you think it is? Yeah, just don't go in thinking it's going to be great. Just go in thinking like, <laughs> yeah, I don't. I I would look it up and watch. It's 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 funny regardless. <laughs> it is funny, and like I've seen him like coming out and like riding a unicorn, and they yeah, also I have. Mean, I think they did capture the essence. Yes, I think that's a good that's a good word. They captured the the essence, the spirit, the the vibe of Deadpool. They just have limitations. A lot of lot of limitations uh, when imagine. it comes to it. Um, and I, I know he keeps things a little bit meta and I'm, I, I would say Ernesto that you're probably looking at a hard PG, a hard PG, a hard <laughs> PG. Like, I don't think he can go out and curse in any language. And like, I can't even think he can use his like PG 13 rating, uh, vernacular. I think it's like, you, he's very limited at what he can do, but just him being there and being goofy is enough for a theme park guest. Hmm. Um, okay. Then we get to see him in his new suit. We found out that the sword is of antima uh, antimantium, which is pretty cool. And then he has this really fun interaction with the guy working at the TVA, and they're complimenting on the new outfit. And he's like, "Look nice, your buddy over there is throwing. Uh, your buddy right here is ready to throw away everything for me." And he goes, uh, and then he goes, he's on the phone. He goes, "You calling your wife?" And he goes, "HR." And he's like, "Your wife works for HR." <laughs> <laughs> I, I, one of my favorite jokes is he's walking out and he goes, by the way, your tailor, definitely a predator. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so many good moments. Um, and then obviously we learned about what an anchor being is and the entity, they describe it as an entity, such vital importance. What, what, uh, that when they die, the whole world will slowly wither out of existence. That's a great question on now that begs the question is that if we found out that Logan is the anchor being for Earth one uh, one zero zero uh, one zero zero one zero 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 five is what that Earth is, that universe is called, um, and we know that Logan was also part of it, and so him dying is slowly um, a limit, I guess, a slowly destroying Deadpool's universe. Uh, mm -hmm. And we saw all those people over there kind of admiring the last scene before he died, and <laughs> we saw <laughs> Mister Paradox like mouthing the words like "This is what it feels like," and everyone's kind of crying about it. It's so funny. Um, and then this is also great damage control for Marvel too, to be like, "Well, if Tony Stark was the anchor being, everything post Endgame, it's why it's, all, it's slowly dying." <laughs> yes, <laughs> true. Oh, true. That's good. such a good point. Right. But also, when you think about it, Iron Man has to be the anchor being, right? Like, we're not going to introduce what an anchor being is, and then we're going into Doomsday. We're going into Secret Wars. I hate to break it to you. They already made a She-Hulk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Uh, and so then eventually, I guess, uh, we learn more about what the plan is, and then um, Deadpool decides to steal the time pad. Uh, then it goes into the events of the opening scene, and then we see this hilarious montage of all these different Wolverines, and we get a That's comic... That's you know it's when people pop up, because you forget this part. <laughs> At least I did. Yeah. You think it... back all the people that were... And then, you, then you're thinking back even further, and you're like, oh yeah, Henry Cavill was in it. I forgot about that. Cavill, yes. Kupara. Cavalween, I think that's what he calls him. <laughs> Cavalween, yes, um, yeah, and they I, to me to, and to your point, that's why I literally watched an hour plus long breakdown video because I knew I was going to miss something. And with a big movie like this, I wanted to make sure we hit a lot of the memorable scenes. Also, he does do the right. I this is something I didn't notice until the second one, but he does the Mission Impossible fist thing, right? Yeah, I think so. Yes, the, yeah, the, the, the ch -ch, yeah. I can't tell if that was by accident because of the nature of him doing the claws, but I'd like to think that it was a reference to the Mission Impossible uh, fist pumping. Yeah, I, I would, knowing them, it's probably a connection. Okay. Yeah, 
Um, but yeah, so we then we see this hilarious montage. We see a tiny comic accurate five feet three inches Wolverine to kick this off. And you just can't help again, going back to the meta knowledge. You know that a lot of people are giving Hugh Jackman shit. Or, or or the fox shit for hiring a a tall wolverine and he's like six foot and all these people are like that's not comic accurate and then deadpool is like here it is look how <laughs> silly that looks people <laughs> hey little guy <laughs> then we get what i learned is the age of apocalypse wolverine with him with one hand and like mm. uh and like that iron probably antimantium like one one hand thing that he had um that i did uh the, in the comics that does have its own claws so that's kind of cool um and then it goes into we see patch wolverine that gambles and wears an, a tux and an eye patch which a lot of people assume based on the trailer that would have been for some reason daniel radcliffe it's not it's hugh jackman uh a cowboy wolverine um, then we get what you were referring to, Ernesto, the uh, Wolverine being crucified with a giant yellow X. And he was saying, OK, maybe maybe not this one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, based off the uncanny um, comic series. What I find really, really, really cool was that I was literally telling people at work and well as Megan that like, you know, it'd be really cool if the Hulk was in it because they really had like this. Uh, Hulk That's versus one of his first Wolverine. appearances. That's his first appearance, I believe. Yeah, you're right. And so, like, oh, it, it'd be really cool if they were able to do that. Like, just have a small scene with like, one of the X Men, one of the Wolverines, have a, an X Men versus Hulk. And when he came in and they saw the iconic brown and tan Wolverine suit, right. and then Deadpool goes, "Isn't this the one where you're fighting the Incredible Hulk or the Hulk?" And then he, the, then the the claws come out, and you see the Hulk. In the reflection of the claws, I'm literally like tapping Megan next to me. I was like, Megan, 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 <laughs> they're doing it. Um, and then like Hulk just like pushes Deadpool, uh, uh, like shoves him or whatever, or kicks him, and then he goes on to the next one. Uh, and then, then the last one before we get to the main one, the drunk Wolverine, the worst Wolverine, is Henry Cavill playing him. Um, and Deadpool saying that we will treat you so much better than those shit fuckers down the street. <laughs> uh, and then he, you know, did what he did. And then we get to the one, the drunk one, the worst yeah. one. Uh, um, go ahead. I was just going to clarify Wolverine's first appearance is Incredible Hulk 180. Okay. So uh, he appeared in a final teaser panel of the Incredible Hulk 180. Uh, cover dated October 1974. So, yeah, that's obviously what that was. I mean, mm -hmm. and there's even been, like, little teases online that, you know, that that's what they want, that they would love to get that movie off the ground. Absolutely. Or at least another mention in... Uh, um, maybe the, in Avengers. <laughs> maybe in Avengers, something like that. I just sound... Like, to me, again, we're already at this moment, and we're doing this, and, like, you, you're already having a good time in the theater. You cannot love this. Like... <laughs> I don't know. Like, throw the plot out the window. I don't care anymore. Look, look at what you're like they doing did. right now. I mean, they, they did. did. <laughs> <laughs> like, look what we're doing right now. Like, we weren't even getting this excited for any other Marvel movie that was focusing on plot. So, like, like let's let's go. Let's go. Let's keep going. Um, and then we get another funny line that Deadpool, as he's like picking up a drunk Wolverine, and he makes a comment saying, "Like, oh, take your time. The audience is used to a long runtime." Um, and then Deadpool sees Wolverine wearing the blue and yellow suit and turns to the camera and says, well, that only took 20 years, uh, 20 <laughs> fucking years to get that happen. Again, another nod that for some reason they never wanted to put him in the iconic suit. Um, and we know that from the trailer. And it's just, again, we're not even halfway through this movie. And there's just so much good things that they already putting into here. Uh, then we get. Uh, they go back to the TVA, and then they we realize that's the worst Wolverine. We get pruned into the void, and then continuing on the Cameo City, we first get this really badass fight scene between Deadpool and Wolverine. It's bloody. At one point, we see Wolverine on all fours, and I literally lost my mind when I saw that. It's something very small, but it's something we've never really seen before either. And it's like, you almost think about it, it's like, well, why haven't we? We had so many, so many Wolverine movies. Why haven't we seen this weird, like this specific uh, fighting style? And I think even looking at the movie as a whole, they really gave us a different Wolverine we've never seen before. And and I think that's really cool. 
given out of so many Marvel Wolverine movies we have gotten from X Men mm-hmm. to his solo movies, we really have not seen this this style of Wolverine. Um, and I think it's just great to see that. Um, and then we get a brutal fight scene, um, and then eventually we get this uh, <laughs> hilarious cameo from Chris Evans, and we see it building up to the point where we think it's Captain America, and then Deadpool's even egging it on, and was like, oh, he's about to say it, he's about to say it. And then Deadpool says Avengers, and then Chris Evans says Flame On, and then that is a <laughs> iconic nod to him playing uh, the Human Torch. And uh, I'll quickly go to you, Nick. How do you feel seeing Chris Evans cameo in this way were you expecting it or you know just your thoughts around that scene i did not think they were gonna get chris evans um when he showed up though the moment i heard his voice i'm like that sounds like chris evans and then i was i i I didn't think it was captain america i thought it was gonna be johnny storm because Mm. i i i don't know where i i can't even take credit for thinking of i I, th- I saw it somewhere years ago where somebody basically described what would be a cool scene in the mm-hmm. future if he came back in an alternate universe playing Johnny Storm, where he, he like goes to say Avengers Assemble, but then he says Flame On. Like you think he's gonna say one thing, or and I feel like it was I don't know something like Reddit, so I don't know somewhere wherever, and it it felt like the writers did a bunch of that where they come through and they're like, let's just make all these little nerd streams come true. Like, <laughs> w- what did you want? Like, sure, we'll we'll do that. Like that sounds great. And it just it it seems like there were so many great moments like that and i just think that that was maybe the just the most fun like he rips off the cloak and you're like never even thought i'd see him back let alone play and then i was like they got to do it right he's not gonna just be captain america he's gonna be johnny storm and i was like they're hiding and he kind of looked like underneath the cloak yeah the fantastic four i was like i I feel like because they're also really wanting you to think with the red that it's going to be you know the captain america suit or whatever and then when it happened, it was just, that was perfect. I was like, that was such a great, I never thought I'd see that. And the second they did, I was like, all right, good. Check that box. That was pretty great. Yeah. And then also in that scene, we get other cameos from uh, uh, Sabretooth and Toad from the 2000 X-Men movie, kind of just being goons as they usually are. They're having this big buildup between Wolverine and Sabretooth and Wolverine just cuts his Sabretooth head off. And it was so funny because Deadpool is like taking off some of the swords that he put into Wolverine. He's like, the fans have been waiting this for a long time. Don't screw this up. Baby (laughs) knife. Yeah. Uh, Don't don't screw this up. Okay, buddy. And then literally just cuts off the head of uh, Sabretooth. Um, But yeah, anyway, Ernesto, what do you think about Chris Evans coming back as the human torch and kind of seeing that scene transpire? I think it was fine. It also is a, a nod to letting Marvel know, Hey, we can take your iconic, most beloved characters, and we can <laughs> put them in another role, and you'll be fine with that. Like, because to me, to me, I they really they did to me they really buried the lead. Whereas, like, you think you think we're gonna get Captain America because because not only is he in the blue and he's got it covered up, his also his hair kind of pulled back and like yeah. big, almost like it was in Win- it was very Winter Soldier Captain America, and it wasn't until like he took the thing off that it was like, oh, this is not the. This is obviously not who that is. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, it was fine. It, it was good. I thought it was great. And just the way that I think what was better is not only given the cameo, is the way that they used him and just mm-hmm. how that joke carried on throughout the – in different various yeah, parts throughout the movie. You were about to say something, Nick? No, I just, I, I just agreed. I just oh, think okay. that that's a – that was I. It was fun because I thought like, oh, it's a bummer. We're just gonna see him for that split second. But then the fact that he kind of kept showing up and then has that great payoff at the very end of the post. Yes. Right. Yeah, and so much so that they had that again. More he does. He was able to give some exposition of what Cassandra Nova was, and as they all got captured, and they made a a Mad Max reference. But then he said, "I'm not sure if I can say that due to IP infringement." Um, but they said it anyway. <laughs> Yuri <And> so... Elsa, <laughs> this is your queen. <laughs> So then they go over and meet uh, um, Cassandra Nova, who um, is the twin of Professor X, and she was, you know, put in the void uh, before she can even walk. She has other goons played by other variants of, like, the Juggernaut and Lady Deathstrike that we've seen in other movies but not played by the same actors, at least some of them anyway. Um, And then uh, we basically, at the moment, think that, like, Deadpool is, like, really, like... uh, 
gaslighting the human torch and saying that he said all these terrible things um, about Cassandra and then that forced for him to die. And I love what followed afterward. And Deadpool was like, eh, he wasn't my favorite Chris anyways. Anyway, and he was also draining the budget. So we really need to get him out of here. And I just think like <laughs> probably I'm half sure. of that is it's probably true. It's probably true. Like he, we only had him for like two days. So we can't like, <laughs> he's a lot of money to put in this movie. Um, and eventually, so we learn more about uh, Cassandra. Oh, she does this weird face hand thing that she's getting to the mind of people. And I like what she said that like like uh, Charles can do that just by looking into your mind, but I need to get my hands dirty. And you literally see like the <laughs> hand going through like his face and his mind, and it's such a uh, like a very dis like it, it looks so weird and like almost off putting. That like it kind of really brings her out. Like to me, that was one of the memorable things I thought about her as a villain that she's yeah. able to do that, where I haven't seen other movies before, and kind of makes her stand out as opposed to just being like, "I have this, 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 this is my plan of being evil." Um, she really gave they really gave her something a yes, little bit so more. Unique. Yes. Yes, very very unique. Um, and then eventually they were able to escape. They meet Dogpool and Nicepool, which is. <laughs> <laughs> which apparently becomes a running joke that the dog needs to be with Deadpool Prime and not Nicepool, gives him the truck. Uh, Deadpool and Wolverine have this altercation in the car, which leads to our second badass fight scene. Oh, and this uh, one's probably one of my favorites. This was a great uh, fight scene between the two of them. How so? Well, just because I think this is when Wolverine, you know, he tells him, you know, it was an educated wish. And he, they, you know... And then Wolverine, like, he says something that really, you could tell, like, he actually hurt Deadpool's feelings because then he mm -hmm. stops the car, he yeah. looks at him, not joking, straight, obviously, well, we don't know straight face, but you could hear it in the tonality in his voice where he looks at, he looks at him and he goes, I'm going to fight you now. <laughs> He's like, what, no quick whips? And then we get into this. So to me, this was one of the battles that had the most emotion behind it, mm. where, like, Deadpool actually being upset and fighting upset as opposed to being who he normally is this is particularly why i like this one the most and you know when they're fighting and he hits the radio we get a one second of the greatest showman i yeah. thought that yep. was funny <laughs> that is so good honestly when i saw like the set list for this movie they released the track the track I list for the too, album yeah. before or at least the playlist before the movie came out i thought that the greatest showman was going to be a bigger part of this movie. And I then I too, came, yeah. I wish I hadn't seen it beforehand. Same. same. I agree. Exact I agree. Same. Exact same, yeah. Because now same I'm thinking there's going to be a musical number in it because yeah, of yeah. Uh, Hugh Jackman's history with musicals, and that never happened. So, but that was just us reading into it too much. And maybe that's what they wanted. They Maybe, yeah. what they, maybe they wanted that to happen. I'm glad it did. I'm glad it wasn't bigger than it was. John Williams in these movies is we got to start going into <laughs> their own expectations. <laughs> Um, and then eventually, yeah, that one in expecting the whole the whole soundtrack for a Greatest Showman. Yeah, <laughs> they wanted to play all the hits. <laughs> uh, and then we get to our next big cameo filled scene, which just has me just so happy. Obviously, we see Jennifer Garner comes in as Electra first thing, and then you have like this bumping music playing, and we see Wesley fucking Snipes coming out as Blade, and I was like, they did not get this man back in the suit so good and then the and then next he made a joke about it and he goes and he looks at the camera and goes there can there's only gonna be one or they can only be one or something like that like a yeah like a very subtle dig to marvel not making the blade movie yet <laughs> which which makes it even better yes. like the fact that they were able to make that line in there again knowing the fact that they've been struggling with making a dead uh but making a blade movie i'm trying to find the line that he said because i did write it down um i think it's and, there's, I think it's, isn't it, isn't it, uh, there's only one blade, there's only ever going to be one blade? Yes, Something that's like it. That. <laughs> that is it, yes. Like, they were talking about the Punisher at one point, and then there's, like, Deadpool was like, haven't there been, like, four or five Punishers? And then Blade goes in and says, there's only one blade, and there'll only be one blade, and, and that's, that's great. Uh, and then we get probably what I was really not expecting, and I was really just happy to see on screen, Chad and Tatum as gambit as almost like a comic book accurate gambit and yes. the fact that that movie has been in development hell for years and it never happened the fact that, that that this movie was able to make that happen is just so good so, and then the fact that they could even understand him because he had like this thick accent that he was going he's like so i i just i just don't know what you're saying <laughs> um and then we get daphne keen who come back as laura 
uh, AKA uh, X-23 to kind of give some emotional weight for really Wolverine um, at this moment. Uh, and then also before that, Blade um, Blade said a line, I guess, looking at Deadpool and said, I don't like you. And then Deadpool said, never did. And that was a callback to them actually not liking each other on the set of Blade Trinity. Trinity. So really? It was, oh, yeah, I didn't a, know that. Apparently they didn't like each other on set. And then when he said, I don't like you. And then Deadpool said, never did. And that was like a little jab at each other. Um, so I guess they were able to bury the hatchet on that. And so much so that Deadpool or Ryan Reynolds even called Wesley Snipes to be in the movie. So I guess they were really focusing on the story and the love for this movie rather than the beef they had uh, many years ago. Um, There's also a great line where uh, uh, Gambit was saying that anytime they go up against Nova, they die, including Daredevil, Punisher, and Quicksilver. Um, And then uh, Deadpool says, oh, Daredevil, I'm so sorry. And then Lecture just goes, eh, that's fine. And (laughs) it's such a throwaway line, but if you know that Ben Affleck plays Daredevil, and Jennifer Gardner and Ben Affleck used to be married, and then they got divorced. It's just such a throwaway meta line that just works so much and just continues to add to the greatness of this movie. Um, so we assume that Ben Affleck died in this <laughs> in this scenario as well. Um, and then we get to the point of the heart of the movie a little bit, where Wolverine's trying to like be a better Wolverine, and he feels bad that he was able to abandon his X Men, uh, and that's one of the reasons why he never he never took the suit off. Um, is because that he was out getting drunk and not being, you know, there for his for the X-Men. And then they end up dying and then he feels all this guilt surrounding it. Um, and then even Wolverine says that um, he says, whoever you think I am, I'm not the I, you got the wrong guy. And then X-23 said you were always the wrong guy until you weren't. And I think that was the great motivation he needed to then eventually go into this really awesome fight. Uh, that we got back at where Nova was, and we got to see everyone back in action, doing all these cool stunts. We actually get to see Gambit be a badass. We see X-23 put on the same sunglasses as Logan and have this really cool fight scene and really get these moments, get them to shine, kind of play these characters once again, Mm -hmm. um, kind of expressing that love letter that we had, um, that, that, that this movie used to be. Um... And I don't know, what, what do you feel overall with those with those cameos, Nick? Yeah, I thought they were really fun. Did not th- I could never have guessed in a million years Wesley Snipes was going to walk on stage um, uh, or on screen. And uh, that one, I think, was the most surprising. I think it was super fun seeing uh, Gambit, you know, live action, knowing how much that movie's gone through. I, th- I think it was funny. I think it's also, you feel really... Like, I think for a long time, Marvel's done a good job of of rewarding the fans that are paying attention. And I think mm-hmm. this movie is really rewarding the people that keep it, t- like, that are paying attention not only to the movies, but also the rights issues and, like, the, <laughs> the ongoing legal battles. And, like, like there's so many, like, layers that um, all these jokes play off of. And um, this movie felt very custom made mm-hmm. for the people that are really paying attention. And I feel like you you there's no way you watch this movie and don't walk away feeling like, um, a lot of payoff, I think, for um, for paying attention. Um, yeah, I thought all, all the cameras were great. It was fun. Um, I think that that battle where they all come back to Cassandra Nova's, I guess, like outpost, the Ant Man lair. Um, <laughs> I think uh, I, I think it was cool. Although I do think, in the grand scheme of things, I think it was maybe my least favorite fight, at least um, how it was shot. Oh, okay. Like, I feel like a lot of the other fight sequences, I think, were cooler. Like you have the, the er, the earlier one where it's just Wolverine and Deadpool initially, which I thought was cool, and then the one in the um, in the Honda Odyssey, I thought was fun because it's like this contained space, and I thought that was shot really um, in, a, in a cool way. And I felt this one was a little more shaky and a little bit quicker. And there's moments where I was like, oh wait, I, I hope I, you know, and then they, they, everyone kind of eventually gets their moment. But it was mm-hmm. just, it, it was still great. It was still a lot of fun. But I think out of all of them, I think that was maybe my least favorite. Mm-hmm. Um, I have to agree. It was a lot to follow. It's like you're yeah. trying to keep up. Like you want to be engaged in all these different moments for these different characters, and like we had all this build up, and they had they had a moment, but maybe we, you know, maybe they could have had a little bit more. Like at least like a give us like five more minutes of exposition, or maybe not. It's probably too much, but still, like a little bit more. Like when you go to the end, you have like that side scrolling Wolverine fight with Deadpool and all the Deadpool variants. 
like yes. the way that that was shot just felt so unique and and great and you could mm-hmm. you, it was so easy to follow and i had yes. so many shots where you're like i could f- like pause this and just look at it for you know a minute um and i feel like there wasn't as many and not that everyone has to be like the same in that way but um yeah it was still fun but i, I just think as as far as uh, the other ones ranked i thought that was lower on the scale yeah and and even kind of going toward that deadpool moment which honestly when i'm thinking about it really doesn't make any sense and just continues the pure fan service of what this is because then the movie go i forgot that pyro uh the guy who plays pyro in x2 and x-men the last stand comes back and reprises role for it was having a secret like uh like a side deal with mr paradox and going against nova and then they were able to get the juggernaut helmet to then put on nova to then Wolverine decided to convince Nova that they were, you know, doing this for good and it's not all bad. And then that didn't really work. And then she lets them go over to, she finds the Doctor Strange's uh, little ring and then lets them leap back forward. And all that stuff kind of started to feel like a little, like, I don't know really what's happening right now, but I'm still going to try to enjoy these moments. Right. Um, and then eventually leading back to like, okay, Nova is now talking to Mr. Paradox and finds a time ripper. And now she wants to destroy all multiverses and prune them so they can all be in the void. Okay, yes. whatever. Um, and then, and, but then like, honestly, that doesn't feel like it matters because we're all focusing on these, all these different Deadpools that for some reason are here now. Um, and but with that, if I just throw the story aside, it's hilarious that Dogpool comes up and, you know, and uh, goes to Deadpool. He uses Nice Pool as a shield because he finds out he does not regenerate like the other <laughs> Deadpools. And then to your point, Nick, we have this awesome. No, sorry. Before that, we get Wolverine put the cowl on. He puts mm-hmm. the mask on. And what's great about this, because I felt the same way when I watched Spider-Man No Way Home, that you had this entire movie making me believe that the other Spider-Man weren't going to be in it. And then when it did, you're like, well, of course they're going to do that because the only thing that makes sense in this movie to happen. But for a moment, you just forgot about it, that that could be a thing that could happen in this movie because the story is such taking you along the ride. I was such enjoying the ride that we got. I didn't even think of a possibility of Wolverine coming back and putting on the mask. And when he did that, I was like, literally just like, Oh my yes. God. Even Megan turned to me and she's like, did you get your special sock ready? I was like, no, I did not, but just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was just like such a great fan service moment. And then I argue that the Deadpool, like, what is it? The brawl, the the massacre of all the Deadpools um, mm-hmm. was kind of one of the better fight scenes we had because you, yeah, you took yeah, these agree. slow motion moments, side sweeping. We get a, a really funny Stanley steamers, uh, sticker on the bus that they're going to, which was great. Uh, and then also we got some really fun cameos, at least voiced cameos. We see Blake Lively voices Lady Deadpool. Um, Headpool is voiced by Nathan Fillion. Cowboy Deadpool is voiced by Matthew McConaughey. Um, oh, I and didn't then, know that. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know and then Kid, Kid Pool and Baby Pool were played by Ryan Reynolds and Blake Lively's children yeah. um, in those as well. And so like, and there were so many other Deadpools that came in, but those are the big ones um and then we also get this really cool like slow motion as they're coming out of the bus and we get like this this action pose uh from uh, wolverine and deadpool and then what saves the day as all the deadpools are regenerating themselves is peter coming out <laughs> and saying peter Paul. <laughs> yeah it's like oh we always love you know every deadpool loves their peter and you know another joke that goes into that and uh and then it just comes to like then we get to the final scene where Deadpool is making the sacrifice play. He tells Wolverine that he's been waiting this team up for a long time. And I feel like that was like a meta line to say. I'm sure Ryan Reynolds even felt that way as well. Not just Deadpool saying that they wanted this team up for a very long time. And then Deadpool makes a sacrifice play of, you know, he had to do something to stop Nova. and But he had to connect whatever to, to whatever. And then Wolverine comes in and helps out and they do it together. And they have like Madonna's song just blaring out and having this epic showdown, eventually saving the day and Deadpool and Wolverine um, kind of sticking with their universe and talking to the TVA and be like, we're going to do this. Um, what do you feel about the final moments of the movie, uh, Nick? Yeah, I think that. I think after the. That Deadpool variant fight, I think that was such a great sequence and such a highlight for me i feel like the second it got to the cassandra nova now all of a sudden wanting to take care of every other universe and that to me felt a little bit more generic and a little bit kind of like 
it's like oh okay and like you said at that at that point you just kind of have surrendered a little bit and you're like this is just yeah. going to be stocked full of moments that i'm just going to enjoy watching mm-hmm. um and so you care a little bit less but ironically every time they cut back to just the two heroes interacting i think it was all still consistently like compelling and interesting and i like their dynamic and i like it, the switch of i thought i i thought that they were going to use that as a way to kill off wolverine in this um mm. universe of you jack and kind of gets back does his thing and then you know has an excuse to kind of um leave and retire again um so i was surprised when then deadpool quickly switches and then closes the door and then he's down there and i'm like oh is this deadpool i was like there's no way that deadpool's not gonna then pop around in the marvel universe so i was confused i was like oh i guess maybe they're both gonna die and i truly thought yeah they same. were both dead mm-hmm. and i was like uh not that's, that's not what i thought was gonna happen and then so when they do you know come back and they're like we've you know resurrected or whatever they say um <laughs> that was kind of did, i did not truly didn't expect them to keep wolverine's character alive and even though they kind of playfully are like you're probably not going to see me again um i think that that was fun and unexpected and and uh yeah, I think it, the ending was 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 totally fine. But I, I think that, and especially watching it the second time, I think this one is just most enjoyable if you're just like, if you just sit back and you're like, I'm just going to watch a bunch of really cool moments that are uh, just going to be fun. Yeah. Then I think that's that's the way to do it. Because it wasn't like the ending was this, you know, incredibly emotional payoff that then, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know. I don't know if you agree or not, but that, that was my experience. Well, it's de- definitely stuck it, it's kept it to the comedy and of it all. And yeah. uh, and, th- and then at the end of the day, this is like a buddy comedy movie. And I oh, think it stayed true to that from start to finish. Um, there was also a line going off of what you were saying just recently when Deadpool Wolverine first got back to their their Earth and they see a little like they go into the parking lot and the little kid goes, oh, my God, that's Wolverine. And then Deadpool goes, yeah, Disney brought him back and he's going to make him and they're going to make him do this until he's 90, um, <laughs> which I feel like not maybe not 90, but I don't think this is the last time we're seeing Hugh Jackman play Wolverine. Mm. That's just me. Um, and yeah, and then we get the funny end credit scene about, you know, uh, Chris Evans actually saying all those things and Deadpool was not gassing light him. Um, yeah. And, and then... I actually think that was a great path, too, because during that scene when it was happening in the movie, I was kind of confused where I like I know it's his, in his character to kind of be like, you know, um. I, I it didn't feel like super out of line, but I was like, mm-hmm. I don't know, that felt like a weird move yeah. for him to like I, I was like confused by it and I was like, why would he just throw him under the bus? I mean, I guess I know he's like supposed <laughs> to be kind of like snarky and yeah, you know, but I was like, I don't know, it, it just didn't feel it just felt a little weird. And I was like, in, in in the in the long run he had, I didn't think was like super funny per se. And I was like, I don't know, that just felt like it just felt like an off moment where I was like, no, maybe not the strongest moment. And then the payoff at the very end, I was like, that just made it <laughs> perfect. Yeah. Um, Ernesto, your your kind of uh, thoughts on the ending. So I actually really, out of everything, I actually really enjoyed the ending because for me, the villains were so like one sided and like very comic booky, for lack of a better term, that it it just reminded me that oh, like it doesn't the villains like don't really matter in this movie. It's really about this redemption arc for Wolverine and Deadpool, and I feel like we got that in the end, mm-hmm. like because I I also in the setup. I was like, oh shit, like they're gonna, like they're actually gonna die. Like, yeah. you know, and we get this really funny scene where everything evaporates off of him except for the cow and he's shirtless. And then Deadpool pulls back <laughs> and looks, he looks at him and it looks at the screen. He's like, yeah, like we know this is what everybody <laughs> wanted. Like, I, what a funny nod. And I, I don't know. I, I really, I enjoyed, I really enjoyed the ending. It just became, it came full circle for me that the, the ending actually, like, landed the movie higher because i do feel the movie was a, just like a bunch of moments that were mm-hmm. tied together but it it made for an entertaining narrative that still at the end like if there was some heart in the story and like i walked out of it like oh like there's this a this is a story about redemption of them finding yep. a way to redeem themselves and who doesn't love a redemption story so i i was i was all for it and once again like the post credit scene I love that it wasn't a setup for MCU and that it was just a, a callback to a joke that we didn't expect to have a payoff in the end. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And, and it's weird. And Matt, because... you said it really well too, where it's it, it, the whole thing was consistent. Like yes. it didn't feel like there was a like, oh wow, there was like it really fell off and felt like a completely different movie or, or it felt like it really cheapened itself or it got less in quality. Like it really felt like solid throughout. 
you know, like to the very end, it felt like it, the same. Yeah, the and same in a way that even even though we were like t- taking a movie about the multiverse and traveling different dimensions, in a weird way, with this whole movie was kind of pits up here's Deadpool into the MCU. It really wasn't. It wasn't no, that at no. all. He he wasn't even. He was barely in the MCU. But he's this not, is a, he's not. He's not. MCU. Yeah. And he's still in his own earth. And it's kind of interesting to think about this movie now is that it is a it's a multiverse story within the Marvel within the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He's not in the MCU, but this is Marvel using the multiverse pl- like plot line to give us a story about Deadpool and Wolverine. I, I'll, I'll say this. What I since he's like he's not in the MCU, but he's MCU adjacent. What they've yes. done is they've built a door. Like this movie yes. is the door yes. that now they have the option to either open this door or leave it closed. He's at True. least he's at least there. He's in the neighborhood. So if they wanted to pull him out, they just have to find a way to write him into the universe. But he's it, at least there. But the story is so self-contained that I think that that's why it works. Absolutely. I think you said it. You said it best. It is self-contained that you, you definitely need to know a little bit more than just the two Deadpool movies. But I think overall. It does. It does not rely on much of the Marvel Cinematic Universe for you yeah. to appreciate what this movie is. It does a little bit hinder on your knowledge about the Fox stuff, but aside from that, you know, it definitely is its own contained story. I see. I felt like I was still able to enjoy it. See, because I've been wanting my new thing of when I walk into these franchise movies is not watching all the other properties leading into this one. Like they should be right. My, my, my thought is that these movies should be written as an entry point, like many Mm -hmm. comic books. Like you should be able to watch Deadpool Wolverine and go, damn, I want to watch Logan now, which I did. I have, I didn't watch it yet, but it made me, it made me want to go back and revisit them, which is when we hit these multiverse stories and we hit these big franchises, like when there's so many projects that you can start or jump onto or whatever different saga you want to read, like they all should be in their own essence, a jump on point. And I, and I felt like that this movie was self-contained enough that it did that. But if you know, but then if you know all the deeper knowledge, you have a deeper appreciation for all the little small jokes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, very quickly, I want to talk about the box office reception from this movie because it is huge. Uh, I mean, it's the one of the biggest R-rated openings of all time. Like the, the 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 records that that was breaking. It opened at 211 million dollars to just domestically an, an additional like over 440 million dollars worldwide. Um, it was the 6th best debut of all time the biggest opening of 2024 so far and the biggest already opening movie ever at the time of this recording it sits domestically at 280 million dollars 310 million dollars internationally and 590 million dollars worldwide and we barely got into the second week yeah that is (laughs) insane this movie is easily Within by the within the next week or two, we're going to be seeing this movie already hit a billion dollars. And it's crazy to see that when we go back all the way to when Ryan Reynolds had a dream of making a Deadpool movie. And now Mm -hmm. within everything that's going on, he just made a billion dollar film. And that is just crazy to see that. And it pays off so well after watching it. So anyway, with the box office numbers, Nick, we'll throw it back to you one last time. Your final thoughts on Deadpool and Wolverine. Yeah, I thought a lot of I thought it was a ton of fun. And I, I think that I would be surprised if you walk away um, at, at least not shocked over one moment or, or mm-hmm. scene or something. Like, I feel like it's, it would be hard to walk away from this movie, at least not surprised about something. And I think it um, I definitely walked away. Um, and also, I, I think it helped having seen it twice. There was definitely so much happening that there are little even tiny little details like I didn't notice the first time when he first sees the skeleton in the beginning that he takes out the wooden stake. That was, <laughs> yes. yeah. He, he's like, Oh, that smells. And he like throws away. Didn't even catch that the first time. Um, and there's just all those little moments that I feel like um, it's so layered that it, it helps sometimes to, I think, see it a couple times, but um, yeah, I think it was super fun. And, and there's so much caught me off guard and it was exciting in, in both, not what I expected. Um, and, and not necessarily in a bad way, but I, I think like you had um, touched on earlier, thinking that this was more going to be his transition into the Marvel universe. And then it was going to end with him being in our, you know, maybe main timeline or something. Um, so it differed, I think, from a lot of my expectations, but in yeah. a really fun way. And you felt like you were in good hands the whole time. 
Mm -hmm. That's a really good way of putting it. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it was fun. And we never and we did feel like we were in good hands the entire time. Um, Out of a five star rating, what would you give it? I would say. Four. Four. Okay, Ernesto, your final thought. So final thoughts. I have a I just have like, as I kind of mentioned before, the press tour for this movie has been like crazy. There's so many different interviews with Ryan and Ryan Reynolds, Hugh Jackman and Sean Levy, either separately or together or just a duo together. And I just want to and even Kevin Feige and Wendy Jacobson that I talked about earlier. So I just want to talk about just a few notes from the different interviews that I thought were really interesting. So Kevin Feige in that coming soon dot net interview, he was talking about um multiverse storytelling because uh, you know this is a new thing for them well you know he says you know it's the ability for us to bring characters together that you may never know you can see great examples of that with toby or andrew or tom in no way home seeing the three versions of the spider-man um together was such a great moment and deadpool and wolverine who died a number of years ago and now we have this amazing storytelling tool of parallel realities so i think it's time that that the movie storytellers have gone to great lengths to be respectful and humorous to bring about the you know to bring to bring this about um he also talked about the r rating that it needed it obviously needed to be the r rating because we needed to fulfill the promise of who the character was i felt like that that was very so very appropriate Mm -hmm. um and then in the New York Times article, Ryan Reynolds, they talk about their, you know, dealing with these legacy characters. And then, uh, so I actually didn't know that Wolf, that Hugh Jackman was not the original Wolverine. Like, he was actually recast from, um, it's a guy who's from Mission Impossible 2. I can't, his, um, his name escapes me. Do Grace Scott or... Um, I'll look it up real quick. Um, I can't find it. It's, it is. Is it, is it Jonathan Ray's Myers? No, it was. Um, I'm 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 just looking at Jeff Chase. I'm not sure exactly who. Uh, Eddie Eddie Marson. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Oh, this was three. My bad. Mission Impossible 2. Uh, Dergery Scott? Yes, that's his name. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. He originally had the role, but he had to back out because of him doing Mission Impossible 2. And how funny is that, that, you know, he, he gave up such an iconic role. So regardless, um, Hugh Jackman flies in and had issues at Customs. And he literally tells him, he's like, you're about to mess up the biggest break of my life. You know, they weren't going to let him into the country. And when he starts to explain to them the role that he's going to be doing, they immediately stamped him and let him through. It was just <laughs> but to him. And he he credits that to the first, like him realizing that this role is something different, that it, this is something that's going to be life changing. But in, in when he actually went for a screen test, he actually listen to brian singer the director tell him to say about him that he doesn't need to do this they already have their wolverine that there's no reason to do this and this is the first time that he met kevin feige he was an ape he was an associate producer on the first x-men movie so after that screen test he takes him out to dinner for he takes him out for a steak dinner tell him you know it's going to be okay you know and then he eventually gets the role and then that's how they kind of kindled their friendship and apparently brian singer didn't want any comic books on set for for any of the X-Men movies, which I thought was like a, just a strange note that they talked about. Um, and Hugh and Ryan talk about their first interaction together where, they, you know, that iconic elevator scene, that that scene was actually reshot because of Hugh Jackman and Ryan Reynolds' interactions. He tells them, he's like, I didn't think I got it. I would really love to redo it. So Hugh went and got the entire crew together to reshoot that elevator scene. So the one that you see in the movie is the scene that was actually reshot. So I thought that was a kind of a fun nod to one of their first interactions. And he, he credits to Hugh Jackman being so, so gracious on set and being such a wonderful person to work with. And that when he, 
thought that he wanted to be that level of a star that that's who he idolized and now here we are full circle of them doing them headlining this massive movie and they, they, like what on scene chem- they have such great on scene chemistry and i thought it was really so do. great um you know ryan reynolds talks about his love of his the physicality his love of vaudeville, vaudeville and silent films and how he really looks at Deadpool as clown work and that's really what he enjoys because it's like you're wearing the mask and it's all through your tone and your emphasis on certain things and it's all about what you put into the dialogue and the physicality you know the way he taps his feet the way he taps his hand you know perfect scene he's holding perfect moment is when he's holding the gun and in the back and he just kind of waves the gun at him and it just like it's a credit to it's more about what he put into the character than the word than the physical words that are on the page um something that's like almost not related to the movie but just really a really fantastic interview is ryan reynolds and Hugh Jackman interviewing each other through People Magazine. You can either read it or there's a YouTube video of the 20 minute interview. And it's just, it's a, it's a beautiful moment between friends. They talk about like, you know, how they just their upcoming uh, Ryan Randall, how open he is about talking to anxiety. Uh, Hugh Jackman talks about, you know, him being a father and both of them being fathers and just kind of living in that atmosphere. Um, one funny last little nod is that apparently there's a there's a moment where Ryan Reynolds got Hugh Jackman to crack. So there's a scene in the movie where he's holding Dogpool. They didn't reference exactly which one, that it's actually not a two shot of them. It is a split screen of two different takes because there's one where he got him to crack. So but in <laughs> one take they liked what Ryan did and the other one they, you know, they have you know, Hugh Jackman not cracking. So you're actually not looking at a two shot. You're looking at a split screen of two different takes. Because of Hilarious. Brian, because he said he was my ongoing thing was can I get you to crack, and then that's where they they describe that moment. But all that to say, I think it was a fantastic movie. I mean, granted, as in the grand scheme of the MCU, it's probably it's not um, super essential to the main storyline, but it's great to have this adjacent MCU storyline um, filled with cameos. A great story bringing back these iconic characters this love letter to fox and what started the superhero genre to get us like because if we didn't have those fox movies we would not have this deadpool wolverine movie today or any of the other movies that kick-started this whole phenomenon so with that i'm going to give it a four and a half just because of like story-wise i think it's it's decent but i think everything else that this movie encompasses and what it means to just the love of cinema, the love of 20th Century Fox, the love of all the superhero movies, and just Hugh Jackman, Ryan Reynolds, and the, the characters that they encompass, and what they brought to the superhero genre. That's what I get it because of that. Um, Great movie. Yeah, and and kind of, uh, kind of going off of what you were saying, I agree with you that I think this movie deserves a four and a half stars. I think the story could be a little bit stronger at the end yeah. of the day, but I think for me like me focus on the story is kind of a way nitpicking at it because i can't i can't deny the feeling that i had watching this movie from start to finish and it was just such a great experience for me a lot of fan service and every now and then it's not about how the movie is is just how you feel when you come out of that movie and i felt like i was such you know i was rewarded nick you said it best that i think this movie always felt like it was treated with care um and like it was always in the right hands and i and i felt that and at the end of the day, I just had such a fun time watching this movie. I, the most fun I've had in any movie I've seen this year, primarily because of all the stuff we know about this franchise in general and what it means to it. And and the fact that at the end of the day it ends up being sort of a love letter to the Fox movies. It's a nice transition from what was, what is now and what it's going to be. Um, and uh, yeah, four and a half for me. This movie's fantastic. Uh, it's pure fan service. And I can... As much as other movies where I want to focus on the plot, it's okay that this movie is pure fan service. It's mm-hmm. it's built on its moments, not on its overall plot. And that's okay. That's perfectly fine. Because we can go back and enjoy it for what this is and what it did and what it is. Um, but yeah, so four to five stars for me. Um, yeah, it was like the but, greatest Saturday morning cartoon. Yeah, you know? Yes, yeah. exactly. That meant for a little bit of adults, for a little bit of an older audience. Um but yeah, anyway, that's our spoiler review on Deadpool and Wolverine. Nick, thank you very much for oh, taking so the time. So good to see you again, sir. To talk oh, about this course. movie. 
thank you for bearing with me as I sound uh, probably sicker than I feel. But oh, you sound um, fine. We didn't. Oh, we good. Didn't. Okay. Right. No, no sniffles. We didn't hear barely any sniffles on this. Side, oh, but... good. Okay. All right. Great. Right. <laughs> yeah, you were put a, sniffle put free. a final counter at the end to see how many times. I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ding ding. Yeah. Um, no, thank you for having me. I, I I love talking to you guys. Um, like I said before we started recording, um, a real highlight of uh, I think my life is us talking about movies and hanging out and and um, chatting about this kind of stuff. So to be able to do this and have record of it, um, I'm always a fan. So thank you so much for having me. No, it, Anytime. It's always... Next- Next time you come, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to get you like a five timers jacket or. I or am something. gonna hold you to it. I'm a, <laughs> I'll, I'll wear whatever it is, even if you do like a little hat or a little badge. I'll wear it the whole Ooh. next interview. We'll, we'll I, I can see small. it. I can see it now that he's like, I'm not gonna come on until you mail me something for me to show on the <laughs> yeah. camera. So it's like I'm coming, and no, he just he, he doesn't send you a response. He just sends you his address. <laughs> yeah. don't, worry. <laughs> don't worry, I'm 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 desperate for attention. I'll 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 cave very easily. Um, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, Ernesto, tell lovely listeners what they can look forward to next week. Oh, uh, next week we are heading to Oklahoma. We are reviewing Twisters. Uh, we're going to have a special guest. Um, it's going to be a great time. I can't wait to another great movie this summer. Um, one I'm very much looking forward to reviewing. Yeah, and 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 what's funny about this is that if you guys were paying attention to last week's episode, we said we were going to be covering Twisters uh, next week, but instead now we're doing Deadpool Wolverine. When you guys go listen to that Twisters episode, we'll give you more insight on why Deadpool Wolverine was the next movie and not Twisters. So a little bit of tease going into Ooh. next uh, going into next episodes. But to Ernesto's point, I'm very excited to talk about Twisters, um, and uh, it's going to be a fun conversation. I know that for a fact, Ernesto. It's going to be a fun conversation. <laughs> um, but if you want more from us, you can always follow us on our social media channels on uh, YouTube, Facebook, and TikTok at Box Office Bingers, our X and Letterbox page at Box Office Binger, and our threads and Instagram page at Box Office underscore Bingers. I'd like to thank Nick again for coming onto the show and just talking movies with us, and we really do appreciate it. Uh, you're welcome back on the show anytime. No hesitation whatsoever. Um, come back next week for more movie fun. You're not going to regret it. And for that, I've been your host, Matt Diaz. Better Ernesto Santos. See ya. <laughs>